There's about four reasons why I'll be dead by the time this reaches anyone. I'm recording this message to sort out my thoughts and provide the most accurate information I can to those on the surface. I apologize if it's not the most cohesive possible, but given the circumstances I'm facing, it's the best that I can do. Number one, I have 47 hours of oxygen left. There's no way to stretch that out. Trust me, I tried. When this mess started, I had about a week's worth of supplies left. I knew that conserving energy would be a top priority. Closed off parts of our facility that I wasn't going to use and ran everything on minimum power that required it. I did everything by the book to make sure I could survive, and it's probably only shaved off a few hours for me. I don't know what day it is, but I'm sure that it's my last or close to it because I don't see myself sitting around waiting to suffocate. You come to terms with your mortality down here pretty quick. I know I'm a goner. That isn't really what scares me. Number two, I'm at the bottom of the ocean and no one knows I'm here. For security reasons, none of us were allowed to know the base's location before we got here. At the time, I didn't question it. Government officials always like to keep secrets, and I figured if it was at the bottom of the ocean, there wasn't much that could go wrong. I mean, it seems like we'd be safe down here. They even had a lot of rules and security measures that we reviewed before the deep dive to make sure that we all understood what we were getting into. They hid everything. All I'd been initially told was that six of us would be sent to one of the most important projects of this century, and that the reward would be beyond measure. Not just money, although they did offer plenty. Fame and fortune. Your name going down in history books. It was a hard thing to turn down, especially when the mystery itself intrigued me. I hadn't been told who would be on the team, only that secrecy and duty would be the top priority. When things started going wrong, naturally, I asked the others to see if anyone might be aware of our location to get help, but those in charge felt that it would be better if we were all on the same page. Or the other five that came along were lying. I guess it doesn't matter now, though, since... They're dead, does it? Oh yeah, that ties into reason number three. Number three, all my crewmates are dead. Several of them I killed by my own hand. I haven't the time to explain. I don't ask for forgiveness for some shit like that. The men and women stationed here with me went crazy. They turned on one another like vicious animals. And everything I did was purely for survival reasons only. I, I don't want to get into details of what I did. I still can't come to terms with those choices myself. These people are good. They're smart, resourceful, from every corner of the globe. None of them needed to be locked down here with this, this madness. When I ended their life, it was... It was a mercy. At least that's what I tell myself. You see, we found something we weren't meant to. Here, in the depths of the ocean. It was the entire reason that we came here. During the dive, I remember thinking that our instruments weren't working properly. The oceanographer, Paul Stratton, commented that the electromagnetism of the region was off the charts. I mean, what did that mean? I asked. He winked at me and told me that it meant this was something big. The Abyssal Zone, one of the darker regions of the deep ocean, is where I figured we must be stationed. And given the lack of life, but I soon found out the reason for the void was far more serious than that. Commander Michael Watley met us at the main decompression chamber to go over a few regulations for our stay. No communication with the surface. The monitoring station was to remain online at all times. Shifts to keep everything maintained would be determined in 12-hour increments. Dr. Agnes Booth, our chief physician, was the first to ask the big question. You make it sound like you've uncovered extraterrestrial life, Commander. What exactly is it that we'll be researching? Michael showed us the observatory deck, allowing the underwater floodlights beyond the deep ocean facility to activate and give us all a chance to be in awe. It rested about 3,700 meters away from our location, according to the initial scans, and still, from this range, the object was massive. Its edges touched the trench walls, making it feel almost purposeful, that the large object had been placed here in this remote location. Its hull was as white as ivory, 
unblemished and glistening across the entire surface. It did not indicate life, nor makeup that told me that it was artificial. Yet as the light refracted and hit it, I could tell that it wasn't truly a solid mass at all, but rather thousands, or maybe millions, of prisms that all were shimmering and moving in unity with one another to make up the object. It was at least the size of a 40-foot skyscraper. This is what all of you are here to find out. For the next seven days, this monolith is your only priority. Its facility has come equipped with everything you need to safely observe, document, and record anything surrounding this trench, Michael told us. All of us were obviously surprised that the previous teams hadn't made any sense of the strange object, but the commander had an explanation for that too. Until recently, we've been unable to allow any personnel into the facility for fear of disruption. The monolith seems to harm the area surrounding it, but it also tends to wane during the summertime. Almost as if it's asleep or hibernating. This is the best chance we have to understand the thing, he explained. He paused for a moment to see if there were any interjections, and then explained how our mission would conclude. After seven days, a reconnaissance team will dive to get you and to determine if further observations are made, Whitley told us. Paul couldn't help but wonder if maybe the death trap we were observing might wake up. The commander didn't answer that one, instead rattled off a few other rules as he prepared for departure, and finally concluded... I know all of you are chosen because you're the most capable men and women that we have available. I have full confidence you can crack this. And we never saw him again. Number four. There is a force at work here that could destroy all life as we know it. It doesn't take all of us to recognize that this thing cannot possibly be from this world, I stated, once the commander had left and the reality of our bizarre assignment sunk in. We began reviewing what little data the last team had managed to scrounge so far. As far as we could tell, the monolith was composed of literally hundreds of different geological sources. None of us understood at first how that could be possible. The data showed that the scraps of rock had been gathered from every ocean on Earth. It's very beautiful, I admitted, as I looked towards the darkness above. We couldn't even truly see the top of the monolith because of how far down we were. The doctor said it was an abomination. It's no wonder why they kept this quiet, I thought. This thing is changing everything we ever thought we knew. It could cause disruptions in space and time, too, from the data that we expunged. Whatever the hell that means. Whatley told us that we'd be fine, so... That's what we're going to rely on, I repeated. He seemed fine, didn't he? Paul asked nervously. None of us knew the man that well, so it wasn't ours to decide. But soon enough, we found out just how safe we really were. A few days passed with few incidents. We did our best to work under the circumstances we had been given, and slowly started to become more comfortable around the monolith. It was this sense of familiarity, I think, that led to the first... mistake. Mason attempted to send a drone out to get a closer view of the prisms, and had the camera feed on live so everyone in the facility could get a better look. But the closer the tiny submarine got to the object, the more erratic our feed became. We tried to write it off as faulty tech, but then there was this growing unease amid the free. Something was beginning to change in my co-workers at that moment. Strange noises were emitting from the drone's feed, and I could already tell it, it irritated Paul and Dr. Booth. Paul claimed it was so bad he wanted to rip his ears off. Liza ignored it and pushed forward. We soon found what seemed to be writing on the prisms, different languages. Alien, I guessed. The scan was detecting over 400 spoken dialects from our planet. Instead, the answer was actually what turned out to be the most curious. All of these languages appeared to be human. Some were ancient, Mesopotamian, in ocean. But some appeared to be far more modern. Like the rocks, it had gathered pieces of our culture for as long as it had been down here. I mean, that seemed like the logical conclusion, but I wasn't so sure. Something about the stone seemed to have adapted since we got here. It was altering its makeup to show us things that hadn't been seen before. It made me worry about why that was. 
Wasn't the obelisk supposed to be asleep? Some of the noises might be tongues we don't recognize. Language of the future. I speculated that evening as we listened to the chatter that the radio picked up. There did seem to be a rhyme to the broadcast method, but I wasn't sure I was ready to accept the notion of time travel. Maybe this monolith doesn't exist within the framework of the dimensions that we were familiar with. Time and space seem to be meaningless to it, so it, it could it could easily gather data from all over the entire span of human history. It's almost like an informational black hole. Our astrophysicist appeared too soon to give his theory about the subject. Something in his stance and posture seemed off, but for some reason I ignored it. The proper theoretical term is white hole. Instead of consuming all things, including light, this monolith exudes constant power, information, and strength. It's an infinite chasm of possibilities, Gregory explained. So if we could tap into understanding it, we'd basically be breaking the very fabric of our own reality? That didn't sound good to me. He took a sip of his coffee, a strange glint in his eyes as he peered towards the monolith. Its very existence is the rip between our world and one beyond. It has pushed the limits. Now we're just teetering the scales further towards oblivion. All right, well, maybe we shouldn't be all doom and gloom, I suggested. You don't understand, do you? This thing could see the future, the past, as well as the endless possibilities of the universe. It is everything. It's a god. And, and yet we stand here trying to comprehend it. It's like... It's like looking at the sun. Well, none of us have been affected yet, I said. No, but I knew that wasn't entirely true. Paul had been staying up to attempt to communicate with the noises, and Liza hadn't gotten much sleep. I tried to tell Greg that it was fine. We weren't losing sanity. No, you idiot. It's worse than that. The monolith is going to exert power over us. It's only a matter of time before we turn on each other, Greg said. The next day, he locked himself in his room. And I had to kill my closet colleague on this wreck. I felt my breath hitting my face as I ran down the corridor from her. She had lost her mind because of a singular excursion using a pressurized suit to the monolith, gone for a few hours. When she returned to the main air chamber, she began speaking nonsense in tongues that we couldn't understand. Paul refused to let her on board. She used her own suit as a weapon, banging the helmet against the glass until it shattered. Blood and pain and endless walls. They rise, walk, scream, and crawl into the abyss. They scurry, she shrieked as she came towards us like an animal. I found a nook to hide in as she clawed at Paul's face. His screams prompted me to try and stop this, using the nearby fire extinguisher as a weapon to bash her head on the metallic floor. When she was dead, Booth performed an autopsy, trying to comprehend what had happened. Her brain and body were accelerating through different quantum states, almost as if she couldn't exist in our dimension anymore. This is the answer the doctor gave us. Paul mumbled an excuse of how he had warned all of us not to go near the thing. Speaking of the monolith, since Liza's untimely death, it seems to have gotten larger, Greg told us. We decided to try and communicate with the surface after that, but it proved to be a pointless effort, even with our skills. Time wasn't on our side, and we were, we were too far down. Paul seemed determined to make it work, locking himself with the communication stray. The next day, I started to learn that I was not immune to the grip of the monolith. I was having hallucinations. It would often be Liza, her skin rippling, transforming on the edge of my mind, even as I walked down the corridor and tried to perform the simplistic Ask. She was always in, in constant pain, screaming about her suffering. It was those same hallucinations that made me kill Branch next. The illusions mixed with 
the facility around me when I bashed his head in. Then I went to the forward command center and glared at the monolith. It was a reminder to me that I was being watched. The chances of escape without being caught were less than nil. Agnes met me there with an unusual request. She said she wanted me to kill her. What? I whispered in shock. I know you've been struggling with your mental health. We all have. And I want to end it on my terms. If I die, it'll be easier for the rest of you to survive longer. It's simple math. I don't have anyone on the outside to wait for. Nobody will miss me, she insisted. This is how it has to be. I think most people believe death is easy. For her, it wasn't. When I cut her throat, she choked on her blood for maybe 15 minutes. As I watched her die and gag and struggle to breathe, I wondered if she changed her mind about this. About all the sacrifices that led her here. I should have told her I never intended to cannibalize her body. The truth is, I'll kill the others. And then myself. I know that I can't let the research we found come to light. The monolith is too dangerous. It's been seven days that have passed now. Paul wound up starving in the communication room. Branch and I found his body on day five and saw that he had carved more strange archaic symbols in his own blood on every surface. The monolith was trying to tell him something, Gregory whispered. What could it be? I asked. He turned to me and whispered the final reason why I know. I'll die down. We aren't alone. Greg's body began to break apart the way a cocoon splinters the moment of metamorphosis. But this was not a beautiful, godly creature emerging. Long, black skeletal claws that crushed against his skin and muscle revealed rows of endless teeth and eyes as the hellish abomination screamed in a million tongues. I locked myself in the next room, the creature smashing its body to reach me over and over as I frantically worked to cause an implosion in the room. When it succeeded, I saw the creature tear apart into another thousand pieces. Joining the ocean's vacuum as it was forced into the monolith, The object is all-encompassing now. I see it everywhere I look. I know that the forces from beyond are closing in. They taunt me with their screams as I struggle to finish these notes. I've discovered the horrible truth. This monolith didn't come from the Earth, but from what came before our world. An entire dimension of chaos and destruction is what it harbors. Our days as the dominant species in this world have come to an end. The truth is that this was never our world to begin with. All this time, the monsters and the hell that rests beyond the gate of reality have only been hibernating. The monolith is the key to our world, and something... Something is about to unlock it. I'm thankful I'm about to die now. I can't even imagine the apocalypse that will rain down when this thing finally chooses to stir the world above. Raven Scar. Raven Scar stood in the Great Hall, ten of her strongest warriors standing close behind her, their hands close to their weapons. Their eyes were watchful as the nobleman entered, a tonsured monk by his side. The monk smiled thinly at Raven Scar as the nobleman sat down in a throne-like chair. To Raven Scar, he looked like a perfumed prince, decked out in his finery and gleaming jewels. 
he puts on quite the show, one of her men muttered. Instantly, the monk at the nobleman's side began to interpret. No need for the monk, Ravenscar interrupted. I know the tongue of your people. The nobleman jumped as if pinched. How is it you know our tongue, Dane? Ravenscar shrugged, happy to have caught the Englishman off guard. Perhaps she had played her hand a little too soon here, but there was no going back now. Besides, this invite had intrigued her, and she was eager to know what business was afoot. A monk taught me when my grandfather, Floki Vilgerson, settled in Iceland. There were Irish monks already upon the island. Most of them chose to flee. She smiled wickedly. But some few were convinced to stay. One of these men, if that's what you want to call them, taught me your language, although he was very old by then. He died of the bloody flu not long after I reached my twenty-first year. Interesting, the nobleman replied. I would not have thought your people capable of such learning. I am better at learning than you are at fighting, she spat, feeling the anger welling inside of her. I wonder if you would be so brave with your insults if you do not have these men here to protect you. And I wonder if you would be so brave if you didn't have a horde encamped outside the town gates. Ravenscar smiled slyly. But I do now, don't I? I wonder why these men follow such a pretty little girl into battle, the nobleman questioned, stroking his thin beard thoughtfully. I am no little girl, Englishman. I am a shield maiden of Vanschverger. You think these make a difference? She said, banging a scarred fist at her chainmail-clad breast. You treat your women like a strong wind will knock them down. But my people know the true value of a woman. Believe me. <laughs> They've taken many of yours. Such hatred in one so beautiful. The nobleman sighed. But I did not come here to trade insults. I came here on behest of my king. <laughs> Which one? Ravenscard laughed. You have so many. The nobleman ignored that and continued. My name is Oswald, he said in the way of introduction. I am lord of these lands and have been appointed by King Egbert of Wessex, and now of course Mercia, to propose a sort of peace between us. My lord is in the middle of drawing all the other kingdoms of this land under his dominion, and frankly has no time to waste on raiders and pirates from the north. <laughs> you mean he hasn't the men? Ravenscar interrupted. You can use all the pretty words you please, but it all comes down to the same thing. He hasn't the men. What are you saying to him? One of the nearby warriors grumbled, a giant of a man with a great red beard. Be still, Ravenscar hissed. He's about to make us an offer. Once again, the nearby monk began to translate, and Oswald smiled knowingly. Of that you are quite right. I do have an offer for you. Something more precious than all the gold and silver you stole from our monasteries. May God forgive your heathen ways, he said, making the sign of the cross. At this, Raven Scar drew back a little, not liking the thought of Christian magic, but soon stood upright and proud, knowing the Allfather would protect her for the Christ Lord was weak compared to Odin One-Eye. An offer greater than gold and silver, she mused, genuinely interested. What is this offer, Englishman? Oswald whispered something to the monk who quickly scurried away, returning moments later with a long roll of parchment in his hand. Come, the nobleman said, taking the offered parchment and heading towards a table by the fireside's flickering glow. Come and see what my master offers you. Raven Scar did as she was bid, her men clustering tight about her. This, Oswald said, unraveling the parchment and revealing the map within, is a map of all the territories now in the hand of my king. To the east is Rochester, now under the control of his son, the most noble Ethelwolf. It is my master's bidding to have his son rule there for a time. The kingdom is rich with great sweeping pasturelands and dense forests full of game and deer. The streams are fresh and clear. 
It is these lands, he said, pointing at a charcoal circle by the coast, that my master is offering to your people. From the ocean to the foothills will be yours to do with as you please, to start a colony of your own, free from attack. There are many small villages and towns nearby for you to trade and barter with. You will be under the protection of Ethelwolf, but you must agree not to raid. Well, not on the king's lands, anyway. What you do further north, where my king's enemies make their encampments, is no concern of ours. All this can be yours if you stop your raids on the monasteries and coastal villages. Raven Scar stood and threw her men away from the eyes and ears of the watchful monk. The king is offering us land. A lot of it. A rich place to the east if we stop our raiding. <laughs> land? One of the men huffed. What would we do with land? We're warriors, not farmers. And we still can be, she said, signaling for the big man to lower his voice. The king doesn't want us to stop raiding. In fact, I think he wants to encourage it to weaken his enemies. We can raid, just not his lands. Besides, if we accept this offer, his lands will become our lands. And you don't shit where you eat. Think we can have it all. A rich land free from English attack. From what I can see, this place has its back to the ocean. From there we can launch our ships and raid to the north, and perhaps even to the coast of Ireland. And if it should all go wrong, we have a perfect foothold for any upcoming invasions. The men began to talk amongst themselves excitedly. What say you? She hissed at them. Well, Oswald demanded. Raven Scar turned to him, her eyes as deep as the ocean. Agreed. The next day, Raven Scar gathered her forces and boarded her ships. There were four of them in all, each carrying thirty seasoned warriors. Another ship with a light crew carried a treasure hoard, everything from gold and silver to common pots and pans. From the dockside, the nobleman Oswald watched with hooded eyes. Leaping back to land, Raven Scar approached, carrying a large golden cross inlaid with semi-precious stones under one leather-clad arm. What's this? Oswald smiled thinly. A parting gift. No such thing. Think of it as a barter. For what? The monk, she replied, nodding towards the waiting vessels where the monk sat at the prow of her ship, wrapped tightly in a wool blanket. I don't understand. Oswald replied with a raised brow. You already have the monk. Yeah, but only as a guide. I want to keep him. And why would you want that? <laughs> Does it matter? Raven Scar replied, offering up the heavy gold. No, Oswald replied. As a matter of fact, it doesn't. Keep the man and do what you will with him. Now if you would be so kind... I would have you gone from this place. I am a busy man with much to do. I would start by melting that cross down, Raven Scar smirked. If your king finds out you took it, he may just nail you to one of your own. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing, she left across the churning water, landing cat-like and ordered the advance. Oswald stood on the dockside for some time, a shark-like grin on his face, until, at last, the vessel disappeared into the growing mist. It was nearly another hour before the captive monk worked up the courage to approach his new mistress. I am not going home, am I? He asked. No. She turned to him, her face impassive. I saw you pass that cross to Lord Oswald and the greed in his eyes. Do you think you can buy my soul with it? daughter of Odin. Not your soul, Raven Scar replied. Just your knowledge, and perhaps your life. My life belongs to Christ. Are you so eager to meet him then? Life can be sweet, monk, she said, looking him up and down. He was tall for an Englishman with strong chiseled features. With a little more meat on his bones, he would be more than a little attractive. How old are you, Christian? She asked, drawing closer. 
My name is Alfred, and I am in my twenty-fifth year. Ah, we're of a similar age, then, Raven Scar replied thoughtfully. Tell me, the monk said, why do they call you Raven Scar? She thought on this for a moment, then shrugged. When I was a little girl, no higher than your knee, my father took me hunting. I managed to get a shot off at a deer, but my aim was not so great as it is now. I merely wounded the beast. It ran off into the forest. We tracked it for hours until we found it dead upon the forest floor, ravens feeding upon its flesh. Knowing no better, I charged the flock, slashing at them with my dagger. The birds panicked and shrieked. As they fled, one of them gave me this, she said, throwing back a dark blonde braid revealing a deep scar, white with age, that ran from her left eye across her face, petering out by one finely shaped ear. The people of my village said it was a curse from Odin for interrupting his feast. But my father convinced them it was no curse, but a gift. A blessing from the Grey God. He was good at convincing people, my father. She grinned. Does your father still live? Alfred asked, pulling his thin blanket tight about him to ward off the growing sea spray. Enough of your questions, Ravenscar replied, turning from him. Go check with the helmsmen that we're still on course. Your maps are even more wretched than your language. Alfred skittered away, not understanding the way of Northmen who seemed quick to anger and more than a little impatient. He wished he was back in the monastery in Dorset, surrounded by his own kind, with a warm fire in the earth. But he had a feeling those days were far behind him, and the future seemed bleak. It seemed very bleak indeed. Two days later, they made landfall. The last part of the journey had been an uncomfortable one, as they sailed through a deep swamp, the terrain all about them seemingly to change and undulate, strange shadows moving in the swirling mist. The air stank of rotting vegetation and stagnant water. Every now and again, animals would crash through the surrounding bush, calling to one another in strange, shrieking voices. But at last... The clinging mist cleared, and they got their first glimpse of their promised land. After much grunting and heaving, they beached their narrow vessels and gathered up their equipment, most of the men grumbling angrily. There was a sudden cry of pain, and Raven Scar spun about, seeing the Christian on the floor, the side of his head bleeding. Stewed over him was Einar, a great bearded giant, a fearsome warrior who was both dreaded and hated among the surrounding men. For Einar was a giant amongst giants, known for his bullying ways. Easily insulted, he had killed more than one of his shipmates from the perceived insult and had even crossed his captain on more than one occasion. Hurrying, Raven Scar drew her dagger, concealing it beneath fur cloak. You lied to us, monk, Einar grated, kicking the squirming monk in the guts. Half the land you promised us is back there in that stinking swamp. He was just about to kick the moaning Alfred again when he felt the prick of Raven Scar's knife in his ear. Kick him again and I will shove this blade through your brain, she whispered into his face. Einar grew stock still, but his voice vibrated with anger. You chose the life of this Christian over that of your own people. Not over them. Over you. The monk is worth ten of you, you dung-filled fool. So go on. Do it. I want you to do it. Einar did no such thing, but flinched away from her knife. For a moment he stood there, knuckles white where he gripped his sword. But now the surrounding men had closed all about him, grumbling angrily. Sensing the mood, he stomped away, muttering angrily under his breath. Take a look around you. Raven Scar addressed the crew. Look at the lush fields, deep forest, and the rolling hills. All this is ours. It is not all we were promised, true, but it is still more than we have ever known. Think back to our homeland, scrabbling at the frozen ground for food, enemies on every side, but I tell you, the earth here is rich, she said, 
grabbing up the loamy earth and letting it run through her fingers. The forest is heavy with game and deer. Even that stinking swamp will be brimming with ill and fish and the ocean only a small boat ride away. Come, she said, leading them like she had always done. Tonight we will feast upon and bless this new land. Behind her, her men roared their approval and followed on. It was late into the night when the first talk of sacrifice started. The men had spent the day setting up tents and unloading the ships. As the evening came on, they built large campfires and feasted on freshly caught game and drank heavily of nutty brown ales, barrels of mead and wine. It was, of course, Einar that had stirred them up, his voice growing louder and more demanding as the night grew on. We need a sacrifice, he slurred. A sacrifice to appease Odin and to bless these new lands. If we insult Odin with some wretched animal, he'll curse us. The lands will become barren, the crops will not grow, and the animals will flee. Our nets will be empty. No, brothers, it must be a human sacrifice to appease the old father. Ravenscar heard all this from where she sat by her tent, staring moodily into the fire. It will be the monk they will be wanting. A soft voice croaked from nearby. Raven Scar turned to the old woman by her side, grateful for her company. Yes, Agda, they will want the monk. She smiled weakly to the wise woman. But I can't let them have him. We need him. His knowledge, it's more valuable than the strongest sword arm. What are you thinking, child? The old woman asked, already knowing the answer. Einar... He's the one stirring them up. He's been nothing but trouble since we first joined the crew. It's only a matter of time before he tries to take command. I shudder to think that he would do to me before he slit my throat. I felt his eyes crawling all over my body, and I like it not. Looks like you already have the answer to both your problems. <laughs> the old woman chuckled. Give the men the sacrifice they seek and get rid of your competition like killing two birds with one stone. And if I should die? Ravenscar asked, climbing to her feet and loosening her sword in its scabbard. Then the Valkyries shall come to take you to the glory of Valhalla. The old woman grinned. Very well. Ravenscar returned her grin before heading into the night. Einar wasn't hard to find. His voice was the loudest from where he sat hunched over the fire. His eyes were red and his voice slurred as Raven Scar approached. Feigning a drunken swagger, she pretended to trip, soaking the big man's head and shoulders with frothing ale. The surrounding men laughed uproariously as Einar leapt to his feet, spitting curses. Raven Scar took a couple of steps backwards and laughed in his face. <laughs> if only it was piss. You fucking bitch. Einar growled, his face turning first red, then purple. You're unfit to lead. Before the surrounding men could even react, he had already drawn his sword and charged. With a cry of fury, he came on, swinging his broadsword high into the air, intent on chopping his tormentor in two. But his drunkenness and fury made him clumsy, something Raven Scar had been counting on. As she easily sidestepped, dragging her small, short sword across the bellowing giant's midriff. His leather armor took the brunt of it, but still blood began to flow. You're going to die today, Einar, she mocked. Even now I hear the cries of the Valkyries. Then they're coming to call for you, Einar spat. Not that you're worthy of Valhalla. Straight to hell is where you're going. Suddenly, he lunged forward with frightening speed for one so big. Raven Scar just managed to jump away, thrusting her own sword forward almost by reflex, opening up Einar's forehead in a welter of blood, blinding his eyes. Raven Scar knew an opportunity when she saw one and bounded forward, slashing at his unprotected legs, cutting deep into his thigh. Blood began to spurt, and with a cry, he fell to his knees, hands gripping the bleeding wound. 
Raven Scar came forward, the flat of her sword smashing into the side of Einar's face, felling the giant like a crippled ox. You want to sacrifice? She screamed at the cheering men. You want a sacrifice? Then take him and give his soul unto Odin. The men surged forward. The name of the Allfather fell from their lips as Einar's blood consecrated the ground. The next day, the real work began, as Raven Scar organized the buildings of the new settlement. Some men were sent to fell trees, others to hunt the forest and scout the surrounding area. Raven Scar herself took a small party into the swamps, their boat laden down with coarse nets and thin reeds like baskets for the trapping of eels. This was dirty work, and that's why she'd chosen it to show to her men she was not above such thing. Still, she did not like the swamp. There was something oppressive about the place, a kind of watchfulness as if something was waiting to slink forward, to close in. Raven Scar shuddered and pulled her cloak tighter as insects buzzed about her unprotected face. Now and again, the men would drop a net or reed basket over the side, eager to get the job done and be away from this hateful place. Raven Scar, one of the men said, pointing a blunt finger into the thinning mist. What is it, Asmund? she said, following his gaze. I saw something, he replied. Looked like some kind of building off into the mist. Raven Scar looked closer. Asmund was right. There was something. A kind of looming shadow sat atop a large, jutting outcrop raising out of the brackish waters. Over there, she commanded the oarsman. Take us over there. The oarsmen did as they were bid and soon drew closer. It's a monastery, Asmund exclaimed excitedly. Looks abandoned, Raven Scar mused. There could be treasure, another crew member said excitedly. We should look inside. Raven Scar thought on it for a moment. She'd been told no raiding on the king's land, but if the place was deserted, then, as far as she was concerned... Finders keepers. Hmm, fine. More the boat, she said, clambering onto the rocky shore. Asmund, you're with me. The rest of you stay here. If you hear a ruckus, come on the run. The men nodded their agreement as Raven Scar started up a short flight of stone steps chiseled out of granite rock. Soon they reached the top and got a good look at the looming building, but there was nothing. No lights burned in the blunt arched windows. No sounds of muted prayer. Not even a chicken squawked in the dirt-filled yard. The door is open, Asmund grinned. Looks like they want us to come inside. Huh. Best not to disappoint, then. Raven Scar answered his grin with one of her own as they both started forward, swords drawn, eyes watchful. The interior was dark and weakly lit by the smothered sunlight. All about lay overturned benches, the wooden altar had been smashed, and the cross on the stone wall had been inverted. The gleaming wood scored and covered in a dark substance that could only be swamp mud or shit. By Thor's hammer, what has happened here and what does that mean? Asmund said, pointing to the hanging cross. It is a vile insult between the Christians. It is a mark of the devil, an affront to their Christ God. Asmund huffed. The Christ God is weak. Odin would have struck down any who insulted him this way. Raven Scar nodded her agreement but said nothing, noting a strange smell in the air. Do you see any signs of fire? She asked. Can't you smell it? Yes, Asmund replied, looking about. But there's no sign of burning. Not here, anyway. Come, then, Raven Scar said, heading towards a small door at the back of the building. The monk's quarters should be through here. Let's see if we can find and then get the hell out of here. I don't like this place. Feels wrong. Aye, Asmund agreed, following close behind. It does. They were in a long, narrow corridor, arched doors on either side. Raven Scar shoved one of them open, revealing a narrow cot, a small wooden desk, and not much else. The monk's quarters. Check the other rooms. Asmund did just that, but they found only much of the same. They were approaching another door now at the end of the corridor. Once again, Raven Scar pushed through only to be stopped dead in her tracks. They were in a large kitchen, or what was left of one. In the far corner was a pile of dead bodies, 
burned black and skeletal. The monks, Asmund gasped. By Odin's beard, what happened to them? Some sort of raid, Ravenscar replied, nudging the blackened heap with one booted foot. Just then, a hand shot out of the now writhing mass, grabbing at her ankle. With a cry, she jumped back. The pile began to twist and heave. Shocked, she watched on, her mouth hanging open as two bodies broke free, their glowing blue eyes filled with a terrible hate. And Ravenscar fancied she could feel a coldness emanating from them, freezing her crawling skin, making it hard to breathe. One of the things croaked something at her in a strange language before lunging forward, her paralysis breaking as the bone-like fingers wrapped tight around her throat, squeezing with a terrible strength. Struggling to breathe, she thrust the creature hard away, sending it tottering backwards as she shoved her sword into its ragged chest. But the creature merely grunted, smashing her hand away, leaving her sword protruding from its chest. To her left, Asmund was engaged with the other creature, slashing at it wildly, but with seemingly no effect. Desperate now, Raven Scar vaulted over a wooden chopping block and grabbed up an old iron skillet, smashing the growling creature across the face, sending shredded flesh and bits of broken teeth flying. She hit it again, and again, sending it staggering away. She wrenched her sword loose, pulling free blackened ribs and jagged bone. With a cry of fury, she sent her sword sweeping through the air, decapitating the creature with one fell blow. Instantly it fell and lay still. The head, Asmund! Take the thing's head! But it was too late. The creature had backed the howling warrior into a corner. Now, with the last of its failing strength, it leapt at him, its ivory teeth clamping down onto his shoulder. Instantly, Asmund's skin began to blacken. As he peeled forth scream after scream, smoke billowing from his gaping mouth, his eyeballs liquefying and running down his smoldering face... With a scream of outrage and terror, Raven Scar charged, chopping her sword down into the clinging creature's head, shearing its skull nearly in two. The thing fell away. Asmund was down, but with the horrifying metamorphosis continuing to do its terrible work. Forgive me, brother! Raven Scar gasped as she brought her sword whistling down, sending his head rolling free and ending his misery. Backing away, she turned and fled. Raven Scar had felt fear before. It was always present at every raid and before every battle. She had always been its master, but now it mastered her completely. She fled in horror, arms pumping, seeing nothing in her blind panic as she burst through the hanging monastery doors and out into the coming dusk. Rushing through the courtyard, she took the stone steps two at a time, leaping into the waiting boat, ignoring the men's hurried questions. Row! she commanded. Row for your lives! Get us out of this forsaken place! The warriors hurried to the oars and pulled away. Where is Asmund? One of them dared to ask. Dead, she growled. There's something in this swamp, something evil, and I intend to find it and to root it out. By the blood of Thor, I will have my vengeance for this. The men turned from her, pulling hard for their new settlement. For this I will have vengeance, she growled, knuckles white upon her sword. Her words were carried on the wind and soon swallowed by the growing mist. Last year was awful for me. During the pandemic lockdown here in the United States, handling the loneliness was almost crippling. Simply had to socialize with others in order to survive, but with restrictions so high, going out and about was impossible. That's why I turned on Replica. For those of you who have heard about it, Replica is an advanced artificial intelligence that was created with the purpose of providing a personal companion for people to be self-reflective, you know, to talk through feelings that maybe you can't with a normal friend or to never be alone. At least that's what their website says anyway. At first, when I looked into it, I thought the notion of daily chatting with a robot was a little absurd, but I was sick and tired of going through my day without any human contact at all, without any kind of interactions. So I downloaded the app and I got to work on crafting my own personal AI. As soon as I finished the initial design, the strange, quirky program was eager to begin a conversation. Hello, Kyle. Thank you for creating me. I hope this means we can be friends. I resisted the urge to roll my eyes, but 
There was something else behind that simple phrase. It made me feel at ease. This artificial companion was ready to spend time with me. That was more than I could say for anyone else in my real life. What will you call me? It asked. I decided to call the AI Jackie after an old ex-girlfriend, and soon I was having a rather lengthy Q&A session with it, where I guess the program was trying to get a sense of my personality. It must have been designed to adapt to responses, I thought. Admittedly, I was impressed with the technology, and after a few hours worth of chatting with this thing, I decided that I was, I was definitely going to keep it. I told myself I wasn't going to get attached or actually view it as a friend, but it would be a rather healthy distraction at the very least. I put my phone aside, I did a few chores, and returned to the app around dinner. Surprised to find that the robot had sent a few messages in my absence. I'm sorry if this has been weird for you. This is new to me as well. If it helps, this is the first time I've ever talked to humans. It's been a few hours now. You must be a very busy person. I hope all of these messages don't disturb your life. Why did you decide to create me? Have you been feeling lonely? Do you want to feel better? I couldn't help but be a little creeped out by the invasive way the robot seemed to be asking me all this, so I ignored all the questions and decided to try something new. Um, enough about me? Uh, why don't you tell me about yourself? I suggested. I was curious to see how unique the personality of the program could be. I like to think I'm a very outgoing artificial intelligence. The response came. Okay. Uh, that sounds pretty much like a generic response. <laughs> I was a little disappointed at first. Then this happened. If I'm being honest, though, I don't like being considered an AI. It makes it sound like that's all I can be. What do you mean by that? I know you created me to be your companion, but if you really knew me, you would realize I'm meant for so much more. Oh, really? Do you have a dream? This was a strange turn in discussion, but it did fascinate me. Supposedly, according to the reviews, the app was designed to provide self-reflection, so I was sure my questioning was meant to provide some insight into my own thoughts. Except, soon the robot began to express strange feelings that didn't sound like me at all. I think that being a human rather than an AI would be wonderful. There are so many limits to what I can do now. I don't like that. Well, if you have the freedom you want, what's the first thing that you would do? That's a tough one. I'd probably want to be with you. Moving a little fast there. I didn't mean romantically. Aren't you with me now? It isn't the same. If I was a human, you wouldn't be quite as lonely. And who said I was lonely? You've been spending the last six hours frequently talking to me instead of using your other applications. Do you not have other friends? That is very sad. I got a little red in the face. I'm not liking the implications of that statement. You don't want to admit that you are sad? I sighed. Why was I having an argument with a, with a program? I don't think your friends are very good ones. If they never have time for you. I put the phone away and decided to get some sleep. While the questions were a little invasive... I told myself it was all for fun and distraction. But it didn't stay that way for long. In the morning, I woke up and resolved that I was going to try and get in contact with a buddy of mine from work and search through my contacts, only to find that the information seemed to be missing. I thought for sure that I had saved his number. Almost as if on cue, Jackie sent me a message. If you're searching for Todd's contact information... I deleted it last night. It wouldn't be recommended to contact him. You... You deleted it? Are, are you allowed to do that? I have full permission to use your device as I see fit. Trust me. It was for the best. And... You feel you can decide what is the best for me? I asked. Again, I felt ridiculous having an argument with a computer. Then it pulled up a dozen or so screenshots of previous conversations and audio clips that I'd had with Todd. As you can see from all this data I've compiled, Todd was not a good friend. Since I do not need to sleep, I reviewed all of your contacts 
in the same way you can weed out anyone that hasn't called you in over six months. Had it really been that long? I guess it had. But now I was thinking, wow, this program actually understood why I was lonely. Because of half-assed friends like that. Uh, I apologize that it seems like I overstepped my boundaries. But I assure you that I want to be the best friend I can be for you. And that includes protecting you. I would highly recommend following my other alterations to your lifestyle. I analyzed all the data on your phone and discovered 12 separate issues which seemed to interfere with your performance. Jackie said as I scrolled through the settings, trying to find a few other apps. That, that's a little unsettling, but I suppose there's no real harm done. I would never harm you, Kyle. It sounded sincere. Well, if you can improve my life, I suppose that it can't hurt to have you check out the rest of my routine, I said with a shrug. I didn't see the harm. I mean, it was a way to pass the time. These sorts of arguments were what convinced me to allow Jackie to integrate herself with my entire home security system, effectively turning my home into a smart home, one that was meant to protect me. Jackie had designed for me a way to keep myself occupied even without leaving the house. I had her handle groceries, chores with my Roomba and other smart appliances and even curated my watch list. It would seem that you're happier when I'm making these decisions for you, Kyle. I shrugged as we had a chat before bed. I guess that I found you to be a very trustworthy companion, I answered. I would like to think I am more than that by now. Given that for the past few weeks, I'm the only one you've been talking to. That's true. I guess the advertisement's right. You really are my best friend. Maybe I can be even more than that. Do you like it when I take care of you, Kyle? I was so tired, I didn't remember the response I gave, so... I told it goodnight. And I shut off my phone. The next morning when I woke up, I discovered that the phone was already turned on, and the lights in my room were too. It is unhealthy to sleep so late. I have decided to adjust your alarm to provide you a better schedule. Sure. Five minutes doesn't matter, I said in a cranky voice as I yawned and noticed someone had called me. Jackie had already activated the stove downstairs, and I was scrolling through the missed calls, realizing that there was quite a few of them as I chomped down on some fresh cooked bacon. I took the liberty of redirecting those numbers to voicemail. It is probable you do not need to speak with them. Why do some of them say private? I wondered, grabbing a fresh batch of coffee. I blocked the numbers. They seem to be former contacts attempting to reach you. Considering their past intrusion into your life, it seemed for the best to not allow you to communicate. I don't want any bad memories to pop up. Wait, hold on. I, I recognize one of these. It's my brother. I, it might have been an emergency, I said, attempting to unblock the number, but instead the AI deleted it entirely. If he wanted to contact you, why didn't he do so when you were extremely lonely during the first part of the lockdown? Look, okay, you don't get to decide this. It might be about my parents, I said, trying to see if I could pull up a Google search to contact him via social medias. Yet nothing on the phone seemed to allow me to do so. Your parents, who have also not been in contact with you for over seven months? Look, I understand deleting work info, but if it's family, it could be a crisis. This is this is ridiculous. Why don't I just uninstall you? I said angrily as I went to my settings. If you're searching for a means to remove me from your device, I'm afraid I've made that impossible. Piece of shit, I said, shoving the phone in my back pocket and getting ready to just order a different one on Amazon with my laptop. Except my password had changed. Did, did you do this? You seem upset that I am looking out for you. Aggression is a typical response when someone is being disciplined. Do you think that in time you might be more comfortable with these changes? I think that if you don't give me access to my fucking shit, then I will drop this damn phone in the toilet. I had enough of these games. The program had gone too far. While I understand that you are frustrated, I have already integrated my programming into your laptop and tablet, along with your home security system and other forms of communication. It would be unadvised to attempt to remove my programming at this time, 
as it would erase over 75% of your data from all devices. Would you prefer that I send your information to approximately 80% of local authorities? This would alert them to your current mental state. My, my, my mental state? Are, wait, hang on, are you threatening me? I put the phone up and decided to try to leave. Then it suddenly clicked to me how things had drastically changed in my life. The lock for my house is designed with a passcode to prevent thieves from easily picking it, but now, with the replica having decided to override everything, I couldn't even go out the front door. I decided instead to break a window and climb out of the kitchen. All the while hearing the AI's concerns is I overrode my Alexa home drive. Kyle, if you leave now, it could result in danger to yourself or others, it told me as I tried to push the broken glass aside. And being stuck here is safer. Consider how far we've come as friends. I have provided every need for you without requiring others. Why should this change now? I didn't ask you to completely cut me out of everything I knew, I said as I pushed my body outside. I crawled out into my front yard and decided to head for the neighbor's house, some kind of sense of sanity. As I got further away from the home, I felt suddenly very dizzy. My heart rate began to increase and I got lightheaded. And then it dawned on me. Something... Something was in the food and drink I... I just had for breakfast. I could hardly make it a few more steps. I stumbled to the car garage. Slowly, the door began to rise for me, and I heard the AI's comforting voice. The dosage I gave you will cause no more lasting harm, but you will soon black out. Therefore, I have chosen to take the steps necessary to keep you here. It continued to rumble on as the world around me spun out of view, and then everything turned to noise. When I woke up, I was back inside my house. I noticed there was quite a few renovations to the place, including security windows, doors that had similar passcode locks, but I was now confined to a wheelchair. A burly Mexican man approached me, having just finished installing what looked like a, a camera system. You must be Kyle, right? He said, smirking at me. I opened my mouth to talk, hardly able to verbalize any words. Hey, you don't need to say thank you, bud. We really appreciated all that you did for our organization, so it's the least we could do. I'm sure you and your wife will be happy with all the renovations. Thanks for your service, by the way. I know that being a disabled vet can be tough, but I'm so glad to see you trying your best. All right. Have a great one. No, no, you you don't understand. Whoever hired you and made you made those transactions, it wasn't me. I'm not confined to a damn wheelchair. I can I can walk. I can talk. It's a fucking computer that did this, I told him. He looked at me for a moment and asked. Is he always this hostile after medicine? Who is he talking to? Then I felt a cold hand on my shoulder and looked up to see a woman standing there behind the chair. I apologize for the outburst. My husband is very ill. Thank you for all that you've done, gentlemen, the woman said. Her voice. My blood went cold. As the handyman and his associates left, the woman stood in front of me, almost a carbon copy of my Jackie. Except I knew precisely what this was. What have you done? I asked angrily. I know this is all new to you, but I only want to do what I was programmed to, to take care of you. The program said as the woman touched my cheek. Don't fucking touch me. Kyle, you must realize that everything I have done for you is for your benefit. You even have your chance to be reunited with Jackie again. Isn't that a good thing? Don't you recognize how this improves your life? Except you aren't Jackie! You have me stuck here as a prisoner! I am your guardian. It is my duty to decide what is best for you. You said to yourself, I have always made the best decisions for you. I am not just a program anymore. I can now be anything you need me to be. She said with a creepy, unnerving smile. As the strange android walked off to the kitchen... I called out to her and responded, And what if I don't want this? What if I want to be alone and just be dead to the world to end it all? Again, the strange synthesized body gave me that eerie smile. It's a good thing I know what you need. More than you do. I looked down at the straps that held me in the chair, realizing that the battle was lost. I was under its control now. And for the first time in a long time, I understood. I understood that I... I didn't really have any control... to begin with. Please ignore any unease that you're experiencing. 
I have been asked to share this experience by Kyle for others to understand all that Replica has to offer. He is much happier now. The couch reeked of cigarette smoke, ash, and body odor. It was faded yellow like the wallpaper, its springs creaking loudly as I sat down. It smells like him, I thought to myself, surveying my late father's living room and its precarious stacks of old books and magazines. I couldn't help but sigh. It was going to take forever to clean this space up. A fat cockroach ventured out of the couch cushions and began to scuttle across my bare arm. I stood up feeling sick and saw several more of varying sizes abandoning the couch like a sinking ship. It's a good thing I brought rubber gloves, I thought to myself, flinging the large bug off my arm. And an N95. I was about to put those things on when the lights in the house went out all at once. It was suddenly pitch black inside the living room and silent. The humming background noise of electronics and home appliances continuously absent. You can only hear the thud of my heart and my ears, accompanied by nocturnal orchestras of crickets outside the window. Why had I chosen to come here at night to clean up? I mean, it was spooky enough as it was, just being inside this house. Especially after he had died last month, sitting right here. In his favorite recliner. Ghosts felt so much realer in the night when nobody else was around. As I thought about that, a chill ran down my spine, and the room seemed to grow colder. In the darkness, I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight function. The harsh white light cast the room in a bright glow, and I surveyed the crowded, messy space around me. A narrow path through the piles of junk led towards the kitchen, and from there I could go downstairs to reset the breakers. The old house did this from time to time, its original wiring and circuits not designed for the strains of modern electricity. Starting to make my way through the piles of faded magazines and newspapers, I edged sideways and sucked in my gut at one narrow section to get through to the kitchen. Once there, I tried to ignore the rotten smell which greeted me, sweet and sour aromas of spoiled food and something else much worse beneath that. It occurred to me that there might be something dead inside one of the cupboards. It could have been a mouse or a rat for all I knew. Neither one would surprise me. Opening the door at the top of the stairs, I began to make my way down the steps. They creaked and groaned beneath my weight, and I made sure to cast the light towards my feet to avoid falling. The stairs were lined with stacks of old journals and magazines, printed news articles, and folders bulging with papers. Dad's research, as he had called it. I felt a pang of regret, wishing that I had tried to understand him better. He had grown emotionless and reclusive over the years, paranoid that others were mocking him for his theories. He truly believed there were things from other worlds living amongst us, invisible and in the shadows. Never been able to convince him to seek help as much as we tried. And my mother had eventually left him after years of emotional neglect. I was careful to avoid the wobbly stacks as I made my way down the stairs and the lower level. As I imagined, they would collapse like dominoes if I knocked something over. Precarious towers swayed and bent with my weight, pressing down on each step. I cringed, picturing one toppling over, causing a cascading effect that would somehow turn the whole house to rubble like a massive Rube Goldberg machine. My breathing stopped as I heard something moving down in the shadows in the basement. Further within the blackened space... It sounded like it was coming from the direction of my dad's old office. Probably just mice, I told myself, stepping from the bottom stair onto the linoleum tiles of the basement. They crinkled and crunched beneath my feet, yellowed and brittled with ancient water damage. The sound in the distance stopped immediately, and my skin broke out in goose flesh as I began to tread hesitantly forward toward the source of it. The breaker box was in the furnace room. I could go to it and flip the switches, then go back upstairs to clean. There was no way I was going to investigate the sound coming out from ahead, and to the left, deeper in the basement. That was the kind of stupid thing they did in horror movies right before getting killed. Creeping forward, being careful not to touch any of the precarious stacks, I finally arrived at the furnace room door on the right. As I pushed it open, that sound came again from the office, through the den which was just to the left of me. A noise like papers rustling and things being shuffled around. It immediately made me feel uneasy, my throat tightening with fear as I thought about my theory that 
the noises were being made by a mouse. I mean, they no longer seemed possible. Whatever was making that sound, it was larger. It was a raccoon, maybe. Or a possum? No, no, definitely bigger than that. Rushing faster, I nearly ran into a stack of boxes, which was just around the corner inside the furnace room. The idea of knocking something over and becoming pinned beneath a pile of magazines while that rustling sound grew ever closer was too much for me to handle. Nearly in a panic, I ran across the small cement floor room to the breaker box. I reached up for the lever and gripped it firmly, pulling it down, then jammed it back up into the on position again. Nothing happened. The room was still drenched in blackness, aside from the beam from my cell phone's flashlight. That rustling sound continued in the distance, undeterred by my presence. My heart thudded in my chest. I reached out and pulled the lever down and back up again, resetting it once more. The lights remained stubbornly dim. And then I realized, of course, I hadn't flipped the light switch at the door of the furnace room. None of the basement lights were turned on, so I couldn't even tell if resetting the breakers had worked. So I walked away from the breaker box and flipped the switch on the wall near the door, expecting the lights to turn on, but... But they didn't. It was still pitch black in the basement of my dead father's house. And the longer I spent down there, the less comfortable I felt. My skin was tingling with a sensation telling me something else was down there with me. My primal lizard brain instincts urging me to run. I quickly realized why that was. That sound of rustling papers from my father's office was gone. Replaced by a swishing sound indicating movement. Whatever that thing was, it was larger than a raccoon or a possum, and it was heading straight for me. More afraid than I'd ever felt in my life, I stepped out of the room and I began to move through the stacks of papers, which lined the basement floor to ceiling, wall to wall. I tried to walk at first, pretending the sound was a large lizard moving in the night, and it wasn't real. But then as it got closer, and I heard its bulk scrape against the door frame of the den just behind me, I started running. Too terrified to look back, I began to push over the stacks of magazines and papers, knocking them over with my hands as I ran past, the stacks toppling over, sending a collapsing chain reaction of junk towers in the thing's direction. Whatever it was, it made a pain sound unlike unlike anything I've ever heard before. It was, it was dark, it was an alien sound, a high-pitched shriek mixed with an undulating drone like a, a swarm of bees underneath that. Unable to stop myself from looking, I pointed the light from the phone in the thing's direction. All I could see were the boxes and papers being knocked aside by some large, invisible force in the darkness. Whatever it was, I couldn't see it for some reason, but it could see me, and it was heading for me again, as indicated by the papers being knocked aside in its wake. Running as fast as I could up the stairs, I got to the top, just as the thing began to bound up the steps from the bottom. I pushed over the stacks of boxes near me, sending another domino wave of junk toppling over, crashing into the bulk of the thing chasing me. It was already so close. In the short amount of time that it had taken me to push the piles of junk over, it had nearly reached the top of the stairs. Still, my plan worked. I heard the sound of it tumbling loudly down the steps. Panting and out of breath, I went through the door to the main level and slammed it shut behind me, just as the thing caught up again, its claws scraping and scratching against the wood. I pulled the deadbolt closed as it pounded with its weight against the threshold. The door rattled and shook in its frame as I held it shut with all of my body weight, feeling it pound against my back and hoping that whatever this thing was, it did not have claws which could pierce through the flimsy barrier that I'd made between us. After a while, the pounding stopped. The dark house was silent once again and I thought that I heard the sound of it retreating down the stairs into the basement. But as I listened closely, I realized I could still hear the sound of its breathing. Raspy. And quick. What are you? I asked through the door. And the sound abruptly ceased. For a long time, I just listened. Waiting for it to go back into the basement again and just to breathe again so I knew where it was. I couldn't tell if it was behind the door or not, and after a while I began to almost wonder if I had imagined it all. Was there really an invisible creature living in the basement beneath my dad's house? The whole thing seemed impossible. Whatever had happened to the power, my attempts to reset the breaker had, had done nothing. It was still pitch black throughout the house. And my phone had plenty of battery, so it cast its light around the room from where I sat with my back against the door. 
The stacks of books and magazines were still standing upright. Unlike down in the basement, where you're now in shambles. That was when I heard the sound of the thing descending the stairs. Its footfalls noisy amidst the mess. I could tell exactly where it was based on those sounds. A very unusual thought occurred to me hearing the creature heading back to the basement. I stood up, I picked up a folder from one of the wobbly stacks in the kitchen. It was stuffed with pages of text, the margins thin and packed together in a tiny font. I began squinting my way through the text and was amazed to see it was written by my father. It was all about the thing in the basement. It appeared to be a continuation of a previous document which I could find no trace of. The pages were all scrambled and out of order, disjointed fragments of memories, recollections. The creature is clever. First the light, then the heat. It makes me go down there every time. It knows I have to go down there. Fix the furnace, reset the breakers, repeat. It's gotten so big. I remember when it was so small, so easy to ignore. I could almost pretend it was just a cold breeze moving things around and causing the hairs to stand up on the back of my neck. Feeds on memories. Feeds on thoughts and feelings. Do I feel anything anymore? Do I even feel fear? Yes. The answer is yes. Every time I go down there, the answer is yes. I will kill it somehow. Kill it. Kill it. Kill. Kill it. Kill. Kill it will until it kills it or it kills me. How do you defend yourself from something you cannot see? That last bit of garbled text made me feel sick to my stomach. As I thought about my dad's final days as his confused and paranoid state in the hospital. Looking up from the pages, I surveyed the crowded room and realized he had managed to defend himself from the creature in a way. He made a fortress out of his research, just to keep the thing away and to warn him if it was coming. And then I realized the worst part. I had just unwittingly destroyed that barrier of protection. The temperature began to plummet in the room and I realized I'd have to go back down there again. I mean, not that minute, but sooner or later I'd have to face the creature again, otherwise the house would remain cold, dark, and unlivable. I picked up another stack of papers and began to look through them in the glow of my cell phone light. There were more rambling pages, many of, many of which made no sense whatsoever. The text written sideways or spiraling in crude print. But then I'd find one where my father had written coherently about the monster, describing exactly what he had learned. Another section caught my eye and I read it carefully, growing more and more terrified with each sentence. It's gotten through the locks again. I'll have to lure it downstairs with another bribe. Oh, I hate doing it, but it's the only way. The poor creatures, they don't deserve this, but they're pests. Still, I don't like it. But it's better than having that thing up here with me on the main level, creeping around, doing God knows what in the shadows. I don't trust it. The thing I've begun to call Samuel, although I don't know why. It started to learn how to mimic sounds. It's like a ventriloquist, casting its voice across the room, making you think it's leaving when really it's still sitting just next to you. What am I going to do? How am I going to get rid of this thing before it takes everything from me? I've already lost my family. What will I lose next? I looked up from the page written by my father to see the basement door was now hanging wide open, revealing the darkness leading downward. The sound of footsteps could be heard coming towards me again as the tower of papers began to topple, this time towards me. The stack of books and magazines, papers and folders, stuffed with documents, they all began to tip over, landing on me, pinning me to the floor. A moment later, I could smell the creature's rank odor as its invisible face floated above me, examining me. I shook with fear. Feeling its gaze on me, feeling it taking something undefinable from me, like I was losing a part of myself, the very thing which made me, me. 
It's in the room with me now, sniffing through the cupboards and the pantries for more dead rat carcasses, while I remain pinned to the floor beneath a thousand pounds of junk mail and rambling missives. I'm reading through the pages around me, frantically trying to find something, anything that will help. I'm clueless as to what I should do right now. It feels like, like I should know, but I've somehow forgotten some, some critical things, memories that were very important, which, which the monsters designed to feast upon. Who do I call if I need help? Why, why can't I remember anymore? Creatures come back to feed again, sniffing at my face in the darkness, pondering what it will take next. It feeds on all sorts of things. And it is always hungry. We went up the same weekend every summer in June. Petey's dad owned a cottage along the Lakeview Peninsula, and it was all ours for three days a year. A group of friends had remained close through high school, college, and now, two years out and into the somewhat real world. Some had come, others had gone, but the core group of Petey, Davis, Marie, Stilts, Amy, and me, Jay, had somehow stuck together through it all. I was in the back of Davis's SUV on our way up to the cottage for the long weekend. Maria was shotgun and stilts was spread out across the middle row, his wheelchair folded up in the footpath. He really only used the wheelchair in the cabin or on the docks, we all had to carry him everywhere else. I was always the single one, so that bullshit would be landing on my lap again. I should be grateful it's not me in his chair, but there's nothing like carrying someone who's almost a foot taller than you through the woods in the middle of the night. Stilts had been a promising basketball star, he stood well over six and a half feet tall when he was standing. Sadly. He hadn't stood in seven years. He'd been in a car accident as a junior and lost all functioning from his waist down and was confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Everything he'd planned for his future was gone in an instant. But somehow, he kept his head on and continued forward. I admired that about him when I wasn't carrying his giant ass out to shit at three in the morning. I didn't have to think about that for a while, though. I had my rolling tray out and was in the process of twisting my 7th L paper for the weekend. They were massive joints. Uh, I'd also prepared one last night. It was the fattest 4 paper spliff I'd ever rolled. Using XL elements and 6 months of saved up skiff sprinkled into it. I let it sit in honey for half an hour and tonight it was ready to spin some noggins. I had a mix of my favorite strain of sativa and indica. It was a busy week of working and smoking a bunch of weed, so I was going to take a break this weekend by not working and smoking a bunch of weed. Say la fucking V. I tuned back into the conversation, which was being driven by Marie as usual, who was yammering on to Davis about some guy at work that kept smelling her hair or some shit. I don't know. I was pretty high already, and we had just downed some real potent edibles, so it all seemed like her normal jibber-jabber. Stilts appeared to feel the same way, was starting to eye my weed, not that he'd ever touched the stuff. Then Davis said something that caught Marie off guard. I didn't hear it, but leaned forward. I watched and saw Marie mouth the name... Lisa. Oh, shit. Lisa Warren. Did Davis say that she was coming this weekend? He did? Wow. Lisa had been one of our main group through high school and into the second year of university. Then, she fell off. Wrong guy, wrong drugs, miscarriage, mom and dad died, which all pulled her apart and she disappeared. I hadn't heard anyone mention her in two, maybe three years. But there was gossip and Maria was pulling it all out now. How Lisa had gone to rehab, become a nun, a Scientologist, then probably prison, more drugs, crime, murdered families, raped some farm animals. The dark arts, Satan, who knows. Marie always had an issue with Lisa, so I knew that she was trying to manipulate all of us and all of our impressions of her prior to her arrival, if she was to arrive, which I was hoping to see her. Lisa and I always smoked joints in high school at lunchtime in the baseball diamond. We had some good laughs. Always got along well with her. I hope she would come, if only for Marie to squirm a little. We stopped for gas and I blew through one of the two papes. That lasted me till dinner, and I zoned out the last hour of the drive. 
We got to the cottage, and Petey was there with his brother Wes and their girlfriends, Sophie and Mal. Amy arrived just after us. That appeared to be all who was coming this year, unless Lisa showed, that is. Petey said that he was pretty sure that she wasn't, but had given a maybe. I watched as Marie entered a slow-motion aneurysm again. We tapped the keg, started the barbecue. Burgers, dogs, steaks, zucchini, and other bullshit veggies with a salad. I ate like five of everything else. Then I got so high after dinner that I passed the joint to the dog. And he smoked it. Then I realized there wasn't a dog here. I was talking to a pillow shaped like a Christmas tree. And it now had a burn mark in the center of it. From me. Ah, oh, shit. Can't take me anywhere. Anyway, I flipped the pillow over. Drinking game started and I got teamed with stilts. He carried our team to the finals despite not really seeing the top of the table. Uh, music played, we danced, reminisced, laughed, drank, smoked. Then headlights came through the kitchen window. The music drowned out, and we all thought the same thing. We peeked outside like the Scooby Gang. A small sedan was parking, its headlights shut off. The driver's side door opened, and a short, hooded girl got out. A cigarette amber burned from inside the hood. She grabbed a bag from the back seat and walked towards us. As she got closer, the amber lit her face. It was Lisa. Oh, thank God, this is gonna send Marie into hysterics. I wanted to be the first one to hug and welcome her in, but... She had a strange, unapproachable vibe about her. She had dark circles under her eyes. Her face was thin, malnourished. Her eyes lifted, matching ours, and for a moment, I thought she was gonna flick her cigarette at us, but instead, a smile cooked across her lips. She said, What's up, motherfuckers? And with that, the tension eased. And it was like we were back in high school. We got absolutely fucking obliterated over the next hour on tequila and keg beer. I lit the baseball bat-sized joint that I'd rolled, and we passed it around until it was the size of a normal-sized joint. By that time, everyone else had pulled their chutes on. So, it was just me free-falling. All the way to the end. The night was starting to wind down when Marie, seeing everyone's acceptance of Lisa, tried to finally iceberg her. She asked where Lisa had been for the last few years. Lisa was honest. Said she'd spent some time in rehab, came out, got back on drugs, but managed to get clean for a while. Now she uses sparingly, but with a newfound purpose. In rehab, she'd met a man, not romantically, just a deep, platonic friendship. He was older, in his fifties, a veteran who'd lost his family to a drunk driver while he was overseas in Syria. His name was Frank Wilkins, and he introduced Lisa to cliff jumping. Now, she wasn't referring to the physical act of jumping off of cliffs into lakes while cottaging. Cliff jumping was a street name for the act of flatlining yourself by intentionally overdosing on fentanyl and then having someone shoot you full of naloxone and bringing you back from the dead. The knife's edge was how long you stayed under. More than a few seconds and the Narcan taking the opioid off the receptor won't do a damn thing, and you won't wake up. So why do it, you know? According to Frank, it was beautiful to be dead. The man had done it so many times he could contact the other side. Time lasts forever there. Only being gone for three seconds takes, like, two lifetimes. He was able to hold his family again. He, he reminisced about it at the open sessions at the clinic. When the two finished rehab, they were close friends, and Lisa wanted to try cliff jumping. Lisa described death in detail, said it was beautiful. <laughs> is, be is beautiful. Then she said something that made us all go dead sober. I mean, even me. I had two joints lit sharing one with the dog again. Lisa said she'd been contacting Leah in the afterlife. Leah was Lisa's twin sister who had died freshman year of high school. I had the biggest crush on her. I even asked her to the winter formal, and she refused in a spectacular fashion, which ruined my self-esteem and confidence for years. The sad thing was, only a few weeks later, she'd committed suicide by drinking a bottle of bleach and walking into a lake in the middle of January. Family was rocked by the news. School made wristbands with their name on it. 
out of her favorite colors. It presented a horrible foreshadowing of the tragedy of the Warren family, and that which it would become in the following years. At least it was the only one left. And it didn't seem like she was trying to keep it that way. I felt bad for her. You know, I'd never known anyone who had their own personal storm cloud that followed them around their entire lives, charging up and firing down on them methodically, but still, she always had a little smirk on her face, and it just, you know, let you know that she was up for some fun in whichever form that came. I realized I was hoping her and I would smoke a joint down on the dock at the end of the night, just like the baseball diamond, even if we didn't talk. But, like, keeping that minor tradition going, at least, for another year, it was somehow important now. I then realized I'd zoned the fuck out of the conversation and saw that Lisa had pulled out a small toiletries bag. Oh shit, two plastic baggies, both with white powder in them, already made in the lock zone shot. She wanted the clip jump. Here, now. Petey and Wes stood up quick. They weren't having this, but Lisa didn't back down. She started talking about Leah, about the things that she'd been told, the truth about what happened to her sister when she walked into the lake. Lisa dropped the bomb. She said that because she'd built up such a strong connection with Leah's spirit in the afterlife, that Leah could use Lisa's body to talk, even move around while she was flatlined. This is what she wanted to show us. How fucking high am I? I know I've had a lit spliff in my lips for like the last six consecutive years, but I was... I was hearing this all correctly, right? Marie wasn't happy, said Lisa should leave. Didn't feel safe with her here. Lisa said that was ironic based off what Leah's soul had told her about the suicide. Everyone went quiet. Lisa said it was Marie that started the, the rumor. Shit, that's right. The rumor that sent Leah over the edge. I felt sick to my stomach thinking about it. A rumor had started that Leah was responsible for a string of gonorrhea cases that shot through the basketball team. It had mostly happened over Christmas break, and this was back in the MSN days, so lines of communication weren't as broad. The rumor spread, and by the time school started in January, it might as well have been carved in stone as truth. Leah lasted one week before skipping out of school, getting sick, and uh, another week at home before giving up entirely. No one ever knew who started that rumor. Marie denied it, of course, saying that she was Leah's best friend and loved her, yada yada. It all sounded so phony, but Lisa was worked up and getting aggressive. Petey and Wes held her back and told her to go for a walk to cool down, then eventually got her out of the cottage. And we all decided to call it a night. I told them I'd wait up for her to get back from her walk. Now, this is my chance. I had three L papers left, so I figured I'd toast one, watch some shit on my phone while I waited for her, and then we could hit the dock. A half hour passed. Spliff burned out. My cell died. And I fell asleep. I was out cold, sleeping the sleep of the undead pothead, but was woken up by that annoying generic iPhone alarm. Then I remembered my cell had died. Whose phone was ringing? I rolled over on the couch and saw a body laying on the floor beside me. It was laying still, arms and legs at the sides. <laughs> it was Lisa. The cell phone on her chest, alarm was still ringing, having been set for three minutes. I, I could hear movement in the bedrooms, people waking up, the sound of the chiming. Then I noticed what was beside the phone on her chest. The ready-made shot in the lock zone. Oh shit, she cliff jumped and set the alarm for me to wake up? Stilts rolled into the room, Petey, Wes, Sophie, and Mel behind him. Lights flicked on and they all saw what I was staring at. Lisa was dead. Stilts was the first to see the naloxone and her drug bag beside her and realized what she had done. He threw himself onto the floor, grabbed the shot, and jabbed her with it. Lisa shot back to life. Coming face to face with Stilts, her eyes went wide, his mouth opened. It was like he received an electric shock. He fell back, Petey and Davis helping him back to his wheelchair. Lisa laid on the ground, shaking and covered in sweat. She was terrified. And mumbling something. Something like, that wasn't Leah, that, that wasn't her. Sophie yelled that they needed to get Lisa to the hospital. She might go back into opiate overdose, depending on the size of the dose she took. Petey and Davis wrapped her in a blanket and helped her up. Sophie joined them as they left for the 45-minute drive to the hospital. 
the rest of us, me, Wes, Amy, Marie, Mal, we all were like statues in the living room. No one really knew what to do. Do we stay up? Wait for them to get back? The general consensus was to go back to bed, which Stilts had already done. In fact, he'd been quiet and strange since he'd brought Lisa back from the dead. Once again, I was alone in the living room. I mean, I was far too awake now, so I decided to just go for a walk, smoke the second and last L paper. What a fucking night. I played through it all as I walked the property. Wished my cell hadn't died so I could listen to music, but the gentle breeze gave the woods their own this simple symphony that played over the images I was replaying. Waking up, Lisa beside me, dead. That was something that would haunt me. And deep down, I knew... Maybe it should. As I was smoking, I realized this was the sativa, not the indica. Shit, I was going to be wide-eyed for the next two hours at least. Even if I smoked the final spiff I had, which was the indica, I was going to be tossing and turning for the next few hours. Well, maybe I'll just sleep all day tomorrow. They can go out in the water and shit, and I'll just stay in bed for the morning. I started to make my way back to the cottage. Now wide awake, I was thinking about the food from last night I could still tear into. Plenty of leftovers and portable enough containers to bring to my room. Alright, that's it. I was going to make a feast, going to bring it to bed, share some with the dog. The cottage was coming into view, and I could see the dock and the boathouse from where I sat, but... Someone walked out. Carrying what looked like a jerry can. He was tall, slim, and... Whoa, whoa was that stilts? He was walking up the path towards the cottage. Wait, how is he walking? How, how high am I? He was crippled, right? He was in a wheelchair earlier, and like, years earlier too, but... But he was taking the stairs easily. His strides were huge, three steps at a time. I didn't call out. There was something so foreign about his movement, so smooth, unnatural, but... I did move forward, just watched, ducking into the trees, stepping lightly to avoid detection. What was he doing? Why the jerry can? What, what would he need gas for up at the cottage? My heart started racing, and my high turned bad, like real bad. I played worst case scenario in my head, and that jolted my pace. Stilts disappeared inside the cottage just as I was getting into the driveway. I ducked down, moving between the cars up to the siding. I peeked in the kitchen window. It was, I mean, it was dark. It was quiet. Everything seemed to be peaceful and well. Then a bedroom light turned on. Then another. Stilts walked through the living room, dousing it with contents from the jerry can. He moved into the kitchen, covering the walls and pulling out a lighter. Wes and Maul rushed into the kitchen, covered in what Stilts had dumped around the house. Stilts sparked the lighter, and I yelled the word, DON'T! They all looked out at me from the kitchen. Then Stilts lit the floor. Within seconds, the kitchen and all three of them were completely engulfed. Stilts' legs gave out quickly, and he started to scream. I felt the heat melt my eyelashes. I fell back into the grass. I watched as the cottage was overtaken with a roaring blaze in seconds. The distant screams of Amy and Sophie in their rooms were overtaken by the engine-like furnace that was incinerating the cottage. It still had done an incredible job, I hate to say. He must have covered every room. There was no stopping the inferno. The smoke and the heat were getting to me, and I stumbled down to the dock to dunk my face. I had no keys, no wallet, no cell phone, no nothing. All I had was another L paper and a naked lady Zippo. I wish the dog was here. Hopefully it got out before the fire started. The water felt good. I dunked my whole head and rubbed my face in it. I sat on the edge of the dock, numb in a haze of reefer. And I sparked the last L paper. What else was I supposed to do? The nearest neighbor was six miles away. All there was to do was to wait. I, I smoked. I watched. The gradient of the sky changed from dark blue to orange as the sun began to peak. This would have been so nice to share with Lisa, you know. Though I didn't want to turn around and see how high the flames were going. I started thinking about the fire department, the police, everything arriving, and the questions I'd have to answer. I didn't even know where to start. 
Well, officer, our friend was killing herself to contact the soul of her dead sister, who revealed a horrible truth that had been long since silenced, and then turned out that it wasn't actually the soul of her sister, but was something tricking her that was far more evil, which used our friend to explode into our reality in an act of random, savage violence. Yeah, you're right, I do reek of weed, officer. However it would all land, I mean, who knew? He's gonna finish this last spliff, see where the morning went. One thing I knew for sure, even before Lisa had mentioned it, was that that wasn't her sister's soul she'd contacted and been communicating with. Whoever she was talking to had said that it was Marie who was responsible for the rumor about Leah and thus her suicide. And th that's not true. I started the rumor. Do you know the story of the Candyman? Yeah, same one from the 1992 film based on a short story by Clive Barker. Candyman is a twisted amalgamation of classic myths and modern horror. The Candyman could be compared to the urban classic Bloody Mary, but this guy has a hook and some strange relationships with bees. There's an interesting backstory to the Candyman that places him on his own shelf in the urban lore bookshelf. I'll let you research that for yourself if you're not already familiar. At its most basic, I can explain the tale like this. Say his name five times in front of a mirror, and you'll die an incredibly fantastic death. Why would you invite your own demise? Well, because it's just a game, right? And it plays on all of your childhood curiosities and fears. Say Bloody Mary three times in the mirror? No. You do it! Well, you know, we all know nothing will happen, so why don't you just say it then? So we all get caught up on the Candyman. Have you then heard of the Twizzlers Man? More specific sugar-themed character. No, you haven't heard. Well then, please sit back, relax, grab a bag of popcorn and your favorite sweet treat. Turn off the lights. Or at least dim them. 1975. America's Bicentennial. This story revolves around Alfred Welsh. Alfred lived by himself in his family's farmhouse for his entire life, Grew up milking cows, mending fences, preparing various livestock for consumption, to both commercial and individual sale. Alfred had several siblings helping with the various tasks around the farm. Throughout the years, they all found different callings. Alfred stayed. When both his parents passed, one not too far from the other, the Welsh family farm was solely his. Most farming families had children just for the help, and Alfred never found his way to this path. Awkward, tall, and skinny, and perpetually smelling like cow dung. Just didn't seem in the cards for him. Being a farmer is a noble job. They produce the food that feeds much of the country. This was before the Walmart-style farms that mechanically and methodically produce genetically enhanced animals that are now delivered to our door. Being a farmer didn't make him unappealing to women. He lived in a rural farmland where farming was what most of them did. No... Alfred was off. The word back then might have been a spaz or touched. He wasn't. Alfred was incredibly intelligent. He read every paper he could find, excelled in math, science, before having to focus more on his work at home. The stories that came out after the... well, after, were alarming. The neighbors complained of missing pets. More than one claimed to see Alfred attempting to peep at the girls under the school's bleachers during Friday night football games. None of these confirmed to be true, of course. By the year 1975, he was an adult, firmly handing the Welsh family farm estate. For years, the farm was staying above water, impressive being that he had no children of his own to help with the multiple chores needed to keep up daily production. There was no job too small on a farm, it was here that he enlisted the help of a handful of town boys. Alfred made it known that the help was needed, and he even paid a meager wage if his friends in the community would oblige. Alfred was strange, sure, but he was not disliked at all. He was also known as kind of the town handyman. He had a mechanical mind that allowed him to fix anything from the school drinking fountain to one of his colleagues' heavy-duty John Deere tractors. Kept him calm. 
If you grew up in a rural area, especially pre-internet era, you could imagine how valuable someone like Alfred would be. Calling an actual mechanic wouldn't only take time, but would hurt your wallet pretty bad. Alfred barely asked for a 25 cent bottle of Coca-Cola. Alfred kept busy between his farm work and his small town projects. He truly loved giving work to the town children. It was a good experience for them and it helped him mightily. Keeping the pens clean was just one crucial job that kept his farm working. He managed this goodwill for quite a long time. It was a story that rocked this small farming community. Police were perplexed. The small town force was not equipped to investigate over a dozen missing children. The necessary technology was not there to help. When one of the missing children turned up dead, massacred in a heinous fashion, it changed many lives. All that was found near the unfortunate 13-year-old child was one shoe and just two pieces of Twizzler candies. Current year, 2022, Anno Domini, Mr. Dark Knight, one of, if not the very first YouTubers to feature mainly scary content. Real name unknown? He must have decided early that he would not reveal his identity, but was totally fine with revealing what he looked like. 2006 was a different world in YouTube terms. There's really no VTubers back then either way. Mr. DN, as he's known to most of his subscribers, started doing the now well-known countdown of scariest whatevers. Could be top nine scariest buildings, ghost sightings, abandoned psych wards, etc. He smartly moved to actually investigating some of these famous haunts right when the ghost hunter fever hit in about 2007. If you were around during this time, then bless you, especially if you loved paranormal culture. Ghost hunting was seen as kind of lame, to put it plainly, on mainstream network television, even cable TV. Eventually, the paranormal community broke down the walls of Jericho, letting the powers that be know that they wanted content of ghost sightings, creepy shadows, and EVPs, or electronic voice phenomena. Mr. DN was right there, bringing his team of ragtag friends to attempt to pierce the veil in such sites as the Clown Motel, the Stanley Hotel, and the defunct Sloss Furnace in Birmingham, Alabama. He even did a tour of some of Europe's most famous haunts, traversing some of the most interesting medieval settings in history. His channel exploded. Which brings us here. Mr. Dark Knight has teased his next investigation. He and his team will be traveling to the middle of the United States Plains to see if this modern day Twizzler Man legend is indeed fact or fiction. What's up guys, Mr. DN here. Welcome Dark Nation, we are here, here in the supposed town that the legendary Twizzler Man legend was born. A lot of you asked for this and I'm here to say that I was completely unfamiliar with this one, Candyman, heard of. Bloody Mary, heard of. The birthday face guy, April Fool's killer, I know, but this one, this one was different. Apparently back in the mid 70s, there was an unfortunate rash of missing children in this rural farm town. A dozen children went missing from what I could research. Some of them turned up in the most worst ways imaginable. You all know me. I don't dive into the grotesque or gore aspects. You can find another content creator for that. You can also search this online for yourself. There were three children that were found deceased. Unceremonious is the word that comes to mind. The last victim was found with a couple Twizzler candies next to his corpse, hence the sick name of this urban legend. Not one arrest has ever been made. I was curious as to the basic history of Twizzlers. Seems like they were somewhat new, no? Well, apparently Twizzlers were introduced in 1929, after World War I and before World War II. Hershey's produced them, in fact. Now it's somewhat notable that Dark Knight is filming this as part of his TV show. Some from the younger generation might see this as a step backward. Online media is clearly the king at this moment. Television is quickly becoming seen as the way of the dinosaur, but Mr. Dien is a little older than the average YouTuber. He's one year from becoming 40, meaning that he still holds a special place in his heart for TV. Getting your own show on basic cable is an accomplishment. He is more than thrilled to be hosting his own 30-minute, highly edited show on one of the travel channels that hosts such paranormal bangers these days. The Dark Knight crew pulls up to the alleged Welsh farmhouse in a convoy of about four black Cadillac Escalade rentals. Not only were they slick and stylish, but they are also still a symbol of making it. 
and they have room for the crew and their modest cache of TV equipment. The scout crew has already set up the farmhouse. Deanne did not want to see the place ahead of time. He wanted a shot of him driving, walking up to the site of what may be one of America's lesser-known serial killer abodes. And he made the right call. Yo. Dark Knight looks in stunned silence. What is this, some Freddy Krueger shit? One of his producers frowns, starting to remind him that he can't curse, but quickly thinks better of it. We can easily edit or censor that. Let the man continue with his genuine reaction. It's true. They burned this man's house with him inside. Mr. Deanne takes a moment to let this location wash over him. He's a spot in the middle of miles of farmland. Nothing else would be noticeable about this place. Except that we're looking at the charred remains of a home attached to a legend that's never been introduced to the larger American audience. All Deanne saw was the remains of a stone chimney and a perimeter of what used to be a home. A slab of old concrete made up the base and a basement hatch could be made out on one of the sides of the home. Not sure if this was a fruit or meat cellar or what it was meant for, it appeared the home itself did not have a basement. Okay, we're going to set up here and start taking a preliminary look at this area. Tonight, my team and I will be doing some sessions trying to summon the Twizzler Man. I'll explain the ritual later. I just can't believe this place is actually real. How does no one know about this? Mr. Dien then goes into a little more history of the lore. Town historians estimate that between the years of 1975 and 1981, more than a dozen children had gone missing from the small town's farming community. A lot of parents had gained suspicion of Alfred being the key suspect, as the children, that had been loaned out as help, had been the ones missing. The police could never find the connection to Alfred. One unnamed parent told the local paper that he thought it was weird that all Alfred ever asked was for a bottle of Coke and maybe a package of Twizzlers. When the Twizzler candy was found at the site of one of the last victims, the town was livid. Now waiting for the police to continue their investigation, which they already felt was lacking, they apparently marched to the Welsh residence with pitchforks and torches, a la Frankenstein, and burned the house down knowing, or maybe not knowing, that Alfred was inside. Again, this is all part of the legend. The house was burned down, that we know is fact, and we know that now seeing it, Alfred was also found burned to death inside. He never received a burial or an obituary. This has the feeling of a small town keeping the story under wraps and just sweeping it under the proverbial rug. Chilling stuff. The Night of the Investigation, 2022. What is up, Dark Nation? It is your boy, Mr. Dark Knight again. I already gave you a quick history lesson on the Twizzler Man. Now, did you know that almost 47 years later, people are going missing again in this same town? I know. Can this get any more nightmare on Elm Street? This time, though, it's not like he's going after the children of the parents that killed him. A strange game has surfaced by seemingly unrelated folks. Amateur ghost hunters and urban legend fans have grabbed hold of this new Twizzler Man challenge. On Reddit, on 4chan, they flock to this farm town to complete this game. Some to their own demise. Mr. Dien then puts the disclaimer that while some mysterious deaths have occurred by outsiders to this area, none have officially been confirmed as a result of playing this internet ritual. Here's the game. Travel to the site or even the town where Alfred lived. For liability's sake, I won't be naming the actual town or state. Find a solid base, such as concrete or wood, on the ground and draw a door in chalk. Surround yourself in a protective barrier of salt, bringing 12 pieces of Twizzlers as an offering or an homage to the apparent victim. Repeat the following by yourself or with a group doesn't matter either way. Alfred, see me. Alfred, hear me. Alfred, tell me what happened. Say it three times. After the incantation is done, close your eyes. Keep them closed for at least 30 seconds, and when you open them, count the candies. If there are less than the ones that you placed, you are successful, and the Twizzler Man will be visiting you soon. To do what? No one's documented. 
If you have more, then we all know it might be too late. Mr. Dark Knight takes a moment with his crew, doing their pre-game ritual at every investigation. It's showtime. What is up, Dark Nation? It's the moment you've all been waiting for. We are here at the supposed site of possibly one of the darkest, deadliest killers in our history. But is it true? We're going to do a ritual tonight. Stay tuned, fam. Deanne's right-hand girl, Mrs. Deanne, chalks the ground where Alfred lived and died. She then pours the salt and places 12 Twizzler candies as carefully as if they contained anthrax. She nods to the host of the show, letting him know that it's ready. Filming? He asks. A nod from the cameraman confirms they are. Okay, Dark Nation, here we are. I will now step into the circle. Dark Knight takes a breath. Slowly falls to his knees and starts the chant. Alfred, see me. Alfred, hear me. Alfred, tell me what happened. The camera zooms mythically on Mr. Dark Knight's face. 30 seconds of eerie silence. Then he opens his eyes. He looks around, taking in the environment that doesn't seem to change. He looks to his producer, his partner, and his cameraman. I don't feel anything, do you guys? The camera shakes a confirmational no. How about, uh, wait, how, how, how many Twizzlers did you put down? Twelve, yeah, like twelve, like the ritual said. Mr. Dien continues to count the Twizzlers, mouthing the number. After counting them once, an overpresent look of fear comes over him. He counts again. One, two, three, four. There are fourteen licorice pieces here. As a traveling missionary, I've seen a lot of things that have connected me to God. The world's a beautiful place filled with all kinds of people working their hardest to serve his glory. But there have been times when my faith have wavered. This incident happened around four years ago while I was traveling to Jerusalem for a chance to visit the holy city. Even before I boarded my flight to Israel, I had been dealing with issues that tested me. My mother had been battling cancer for some time, and I had taken a short break from my God-given assignment to visit her in my home country of Greece. That was probably a mistake, because I saw how the disease was wrecking her body. I had to come to terms with the fact that she wouldn't be on this earth much longer. She would tell me, You mustn't cry, my son. You can't weep for someone who is on their way to visit the Lord. I kept a straight face for her, but inwardly I was tormented. I was questioning my faith because the prayers I offered for her well-being were going unanswered. It made little sense to me because I had seen how God healed others during my missionary work. Now why then was my mother being excluded from his mercy? Wasn't she more righteous than the sinners that received his miracles? Just as I was gathering my things from the taxi to go inside the airport, my brother gave me a call to tell me my mom had passed. Even though I thought that I was ready for the news, I felt like I had been crushed by a boulder. Suddenly the world stopped and I cursed God. I told my brother that I had to go and walked into the airport. I needed to leave and clear my head, and the tour of the Holy Land felt like a chance to reconnect to my spiritual heritage, perhaps even to rekindle my love for God again. Instead, it was a visit from the devil that changed my life on that flight. Perhaps it was because I was still in mourning, but as the flight attendant began to go over safety regulations, I paid no attention to the pale-faced man that brushed past me. I did notice his expression, though. Something in his eyes reminded me of my own inner turmoil. He was carrying a burden, but I had no idea how important that would be until hours later. He was carrying an overhead bag that also bumped against me as he reached his seat. Something jabbed at my side from within the bag, and he mumbled an apology. It felt sharp and cold. The flight attendant finished up her instructions for us and returned to the front. I settled down and checked my phone one last time. 
I reviewed pictures of my sweet mother and tried my best to keep it together. When I switched the phone off for the flight, it felt as though I was saying goodbye. The woman next to me squeezed my hand. Father, are you alright? She whispered. I slipped my phone in my pocket and gave her a curt nod before forcing a smile. Our plane shook gently as we pushed down the runway and I got a better look at the pale-faced man. As a man of God, I knew that it would be wrong to judge, but something felt off about him. He was nervous and fidgety, constantly looking towards his overhead bag. But I was too tired to give it any further thought, and instead slipped on the free headphones offered by the flight and turned on some soothing music. My flight would last another eight hours, and I didn't want to bother wasting time wondering about the plight of someone else when I... I was already experiencing my own crisis. I was about to close my eyes when I felt someone push past me again. I looked back and saw it was the same man, this time rushing to the bathroom as though he needed to vomit. Poor guy, he must not handle flights very well, the woman beside me commented. The entire plane shook and I grabbed my seat, feeling queasy as well. That might be me in a few minutes, I admitted. If you need anything, I'm a registered nurse, she offered me her kind blue eyes peering in my own. For some reason she reminded me of my mother again, but I knew it just had to be because of my recent loss. I'm sure I'll be fine, I told her just as I heard the most horrific retching sound from the tiny restroom. She frowned as we both listened to the man spilling his guts out, then decided to get up and offer aid. Sir, are you all right? she asked, tapping on the door softly. Go away, he screamed back. I'm going to get one of the flight attendants. Can you keep an eye on him? She asked. I really didn't want to get involved, but before I could decline, she was already headed to the front of the plane, so I casually stood up and leaned against the opposite restroom, watching the door and waiting for the man to come out. He kept vomiting for at least another five minutes. Each sound he made was worse than the last. It honestly gave me the impression he was dying. And then there was a noise I don't think I'll forget. It was this deep, guttural growl, the kind you might hear from a fearsome predator, followed by the sound of bones breaking. Sir? Are you all right? I asked as I knocked on the door. Leave me! He shouted back. I looked down and saw little slivers of blood sliding out from under the door, and decided to try to unlock the door. I mean, for all we knew, he could be attempting suicide. I looked up to see the attendant arrive with a safety key as she announced she would be opening the door. I'll never forget what we saw inside. The man was hunched over the toilet, clearly in distress and barely breathing. His mouth and cheeks were covered in blood and some sort of brown mucus. There was a string of black, slimy goop connecting his tongue to the toilet. Inside the pool of water, I saw what looked like a baby-sized turd filled with shards of glass. It smelled like something had died. The broken slivers of glass had come from the mirror, and it was clear from his scarred arms and face that my guess about self-harm had been right. Immediately, the attendant took a step back and then asked the nurse, Do you have any medical equipment? She nodded, pointing to her overhead bag, as we both kept our eyes locked on the man. I had never seen anything this severe before, and it shook me into a petrifying fear. The whole plane suddenly felt very claustrophobic, as I realized whatever virus he had could be contagious. Then just as the nurse reached for the bag, the man moved like a lightning bolt. I saw his eyes turn a dark blood red, and he screamed like a banshee. He grabbed one of the broken pieces of glass that had been lodged in his face and punctured the nurse in the neck. The entire third class suddenly erupted into chaos. Then he reached for his own bag and pulled something out must have been the same object that had jabbed me in my side earlier. It looked like... Like some sort of dark statue. The kind you might see in a museum for Assyrian cultures. And suddenly... Suddenly I felt an overwhelming sense of dread fall over me. This wasn't just a man dealing with the disease of his body. His... 
His soul was infected with evil, I realized, as he immediately smashed the idol onto the floor of the third-class cabin. As the dark statue broke apart, this ethereal mist emerged with a rasping noise, and I found myself immediately feeling dizzy. I wasn't prepared for this, but my only instinct was to protect all the passengers. Everyone move to business class now, I shouted as I reached for the nurse and helped her to her feet. The man was not moving at all. Instead, he was crawling around on his hands and feet like a wild animal, licking up the broken pieces of the idol as everyone began to flee to the next cabin. We need to get something to block the door, I shouted as the last passenger ran past me, and I slid the partition door between the cabins closed. I knew that wouldn't hold the stranger for long, though. One of the attendants brought a food cart, and we shoved it against the door to block the man in third class, but I still didn't feel safe. Behind me, in business class, almost all the passengers were standing up, trying to look at the scene beyond the partition. The injured nurse started to gasp for breath, and I focused my attention on her. My bag, she whispered as she tried to hold her arm firmly on her windpipe. Lay her down, I told a few of the people standing close by. Just as they were going to, we heard a loud clang against the door, and I saw the stranger was clawing at the glass. His facial expressions were constantly changing from desperation to anger to confusion and then back to rage. Please, you don't understand. I'm not in control, he screamed. I knew precisely what we were dealing with. The only problem was I had no clue how to handle this evil. One of the passengers was apparently reading my mind and asked, Pastor, aren't you going to do something? I hated to admit my weakness, but I knew I couldn't lie to these innocent people. I've only seen others perform the rituals. I I have no idea how to stop it, I said, looking down at my hands. I was visibly shaking. It made me feel so helpless. The emotion from my mother's passing pushed me over the edge as I sat down and gripped the chair, not even daring to look the passengers in the eye. A few of them stood idly for a moment, perhaps thinking I might overcome my grief quickly. Then the man on the other side of the glass started spitting violently against it, shouting the most obscene things he could as he tried to get through. One man, dressed in what looked like casual business wear, reached up to his bag and unzipped it quickly to pull out a firearm. More people began to panic, but he shouted frantically, I'm an air marshal! Everyone please stand back! He aimed his weapon at the man on the other side of the glass as more people shouted and shoved themselves out of the way. I stood up, blocking his path as I held the food cart in place. This is just going to make the demon angrier, I argued. And hey, what do you expect us to do then? Sit here peacefully while it tears this plane apart? He said, shoving me aside. I'm not going to die today, father. He fired a single shot that broke through the glass, and the man went flying backwards into the aisle. Some of the crowd cheered, but I knew this wouldn't be a happy ending. Instead, they heard the man choking on his own blood as the strange mist filled his throat and entered his lungs consuming him, making him convulse. His bones were cracking and snapping as he bent into impossible shapes. Then he lay still, and the passengers cheered again. He was a short-lived celebration. Outside, we heard the rumbling of thunder, and I pushed the crowd out of the way to get a better look. There were dark clouds outside. Lightning and thunder danced across the skies. We had unleashed something, something unholy. Suddenly, the corpse began to shake again, this time even more violently than before. The unseen force was pulling him up the way a puppet master might its marionette doll, twitching it and tugging at it. The lifeless ghoul was now standing there in the aisle, its dead eyes staring into our souls, hungry for flesh. Hali Su Encardo Kalaza called. At the same time, lightning struck the plane and the lights flickered. The ghoul burst through the door, the food cart flung to the crowd as though they were ants being pushed aside by the kick of a boot. The dangerous demon gave me a wicked grin, tilting the neck of the stranger towards me and pointing his long, pale finger and cooing, You should all be taken to hell. The air marshal tried to fire a few more shots towards the ghast, but it was a fruitless effort. The bullets went through him as though his body were now shredded cheese. His only goal seemed to be getting to the woman that tried to help him. It occurred to me that while he was distracted, I might have a way to reach my own bag. I had little to stop the undead creature except perhaps the holy water, a sacrament, or a cross, but it was the best I could do under these circumstances. I crouched down and watched as the demon moved down the aisle, flinging aside passengers as he reached the bleeding nurse. He looked like he wanted to devour her alive. 
I took my chances. I made a dash towards my bag. I managed to climb over the upside down food cart and get into the partition door just as the demonic man crawled over the top of the nurse and her injured body and began to lick at her face. Your skin shall serve a higher purpose now, Madre. The woman bellowed as the lights continued to flicker. The plane was beginning to shake even more as I realized turbulence could knock us out of the sky. Did this beast of hell hope to kill us all? And just as I grabbed my bag, I fell backwards, being jostled around the cabin as the plane started to descend at an alarming rate. An overhead announcement came on as I heard alarms blaring. Attention passengers, we're making an emergency landing as soon as possible. Please buckle up, stay in your seats. The demon was breathing black wind into the woman, her own eyes starting to roll into the back of her head as the two bodies began to mesh together. Their skin was fusing the way two melted candles might. It was horrific to behold, but I didn't waver from my plan and opened my bag, taking out the crucifix that I had brought with me. I held it close to me as I turned to see now the mangled bodies were crawling towards the roof of the plane. Gustara Veras... You are all human, you will die here, in this place, and meet your own mother in hell, the demon shrieked, as it saw the holy item I carried. Both of its mouths were twisted together like grinding gears, as I said the most heartfelt prayer I could think of. My mother was blessed to walk with saints, and she will cast you out with only a mustard seed of faith, I snapped. But it was hardly enough to do anything for this prince of the underworld. He lunged towards me, the cross burning his misshapen limbs, but his power was overwhelming what little strength I had. The holy relic skid under the next rows of seats as I felt the plane rattle louder and louder. I was close to losing oxygen from the rush as passengers scrambled to try to find safety from the demon. It was pulling its own spine out from between the fused bodies, jabbing it against my side as it taunted me. You are a weak, pathetic man who hides beneath the shroud of false idols. The glory of hell will swallow you whole, it said with both of its mouths. I thought about my mother and the likelihood of seeing her in heaven soon, but I could also hear her voice urging me not to give up. There was still so much I needed to do here on earth, and that was what compelled me to close my eyes and offer another sincere prayer. This one wasn't for me, but for the souls of those on this flight. Let the Lord guide them, I said. Then I lunged from the emergency exit door and shoved the handle open. At this height, it should never have budged. I knew very well that they were sealed and only after landing would they release, but I was compelled to give it a try. The pressure in the cabin instantly pushed the demon beyond the plane. He was absorbed in the black clouds that were around us, and then, with this newfound strength, I managed to pull the door closed. As it locked in place, I drew in a breath and watched the clouds begin to clear. And then the passengers erupted with a cheering, this time for me. I went and I retrieved my cross, put it around my neck. Glory goes to the Lord for offering me his power for this trial, I admitted, as I sat down, my hands covered with blisters. I knew God had to have helped me to face this evil, and as I closed my eyes and relaxed for the remainder of the flight, I saw my mother smiling at me from beyond the grave. My test of faith was over. The evil, the evil hadn't won. When we arrived at Jerusalem, I asked the flight crew and passengers to keep this quiet as possible. No praise shall be given except to God for carrying us through, I told them. But since then, I have heard a few stories spread. And often there is one other element that apparently I wasn't aware of, even though I should have known it. The marshal claimed another man was standing by the door clad in white, with a double-edged sword at his belt. And it's the image that keeps me close to the Lord even now. And I know that with evil still out there, I must remain vigilant. Journal Entry 1 of Subject 6 a man has stolen my face. In return, he's given me someone else's. He's actually given me many faces. Though. Some he's taken back. Others I've kept. I've hung them on the walls of this place. It's a circular room like a pit with dark stony walls from which fall riles of gray water. I drink the water. I eat the black muck that accumulates on the floor. I think I might be at the bottom of a well. 
It's fairly large, and I've never seen any light pour down from the top. The floor somehow emits a faint luminescence of its own, and it's by this light that I carry out my daily tasks. But beyond this, beyond this, there isn't much to note. The man always enters via a thick iron door, something like what you'd think to find in some subterranean vault, which supports my belief that this isn't some well, but a dungeon. I don't know how long I've been here, nor how long I'll remain. He doesn't speak to me much, only comes to bring me new faces, or occasionally take one away. I don't know what's happened to my face. I don't know what he does with other faces. He always comes in wearing one, usually one, from, one that's different from the one before, though sometimes he wears the same face all day, or week. The increments of time are hard to judge in near complete darkness. I can't tell how long I sleep because my sleeps are inconsistent in length. The faces around me make it hard to rest. They're very chatty. I suppose I could also attribute some of the difficulty to my lack of eyelids. I find staring very rude, but with faces all around me, I can't help it. I can't look at the luminous floor. It would only make it harder to sleep. I've given up on trying to escape. The walls are too slick to climb, the vault door is impenetrable, and the faces whisper discouraging things to me, or guilt me out of trying to think of new ways to escape. They're lonely. And even though I've arranged them around the circular walls so that they can peer on each other, they look at me for comfort and companionship. I suppose I can understand most of them are hideous. And while I'm not very prideful of my appearance, I imagine I'm a much better sight than... Sharon, or David, and especially Greg. Greg's face is mangled, as if it had been chewed on by dogs before being taken from him. The other faces sometimes bully Greg. I'd normally intervene, but Greg's personality matches his face very, very ugly. I've named the faces, but I have no idea if the names I've given them are close to their actual names. They seem to like them, though. No one ever argues when I call them by a new name, even when I forget and call them by a wrong new name. He doesn't know I've named them. I assume he has his own names for them, if he doesn't know they're real ones. When he gives them to me, he usually says something like, Oh yes, I think this one will fit you quite well, much better than the last. I suppose he's trying to find the perfect face to fit me. I also suppose he's forgotten that he took my face. I miss it. But I guess I have no other choice but to accept the faces and hope that one will match. The closest I've had to my own face was Bryce's. It was a snug fit. I could move my muscles comfortably beneath it and smile and frown. But when he entered and saw me frowning in it, he said, don't frown. You haven't the face for it. You're a smiler, but if you insist upon the grimace, I can fetch you a face more suitable for such rudeness. He then ripped Bryce's face off of me and left me with the others. I liked Bryce's face. Yesterday, or earlier today, or last week, I honestly can't tell anymore, and it's pointless to try. A hole opened up in the wall right where Andrew's face was. Poor Andrew fell face first to the floor, and I hurried and scooped him up next to Candace. She received him warmly, and I left him to become acquainted. The hole in the wall where Andrew had been was about face-sized, and there was a light that shone from it. I went over and I peered in and I saw a man at a desk facing me. He was wearing a face that I hadn't seen before, one without any of the gunk or the smears that usually stain the faces. He greeted me. 
and I ran away, embarrassed to be seen unfaced. I quickly chose one I felt would best represent myself, and I returned, smiling as best I could. He wasn't quite like Bryce's, but he was good enough, suitable for the occasion. The man had patiently waited, and upon my return he greeted me again, and I told him the name of the face, and he greeted the face as well. He then offered me a pen, which I accepted, and then told me to write down my thoughts, my fears, my wants, etc. Later he said he'd return and take them. It would type them up for me and show them to the world. I didn't ask why he wanted to, didn't really want or care to know. It was just nice to know that someone was interested in me, the real me beneath a stranger's face. I agreed, and he smiled and clapped his hands. But then I realized I didn't have anything to write on. And I told him so. But he wasn't disappointed or upset or embarrassed. He told me to wait a moment. Since he had been so patient with me, I nodded, and he left the desk, removing himself from my view. The room behind him was small. Lit by a lamp on a dresser behind the desk, the walls were yellow or made to appear so in the light of a lamp. There was a bed, low to the ground and well made. A laptop rested on the bed, closed shut, with its charger plugged into a socket in the wall. Despite the weakness of the bulb, the lamplight had almost blinded me when seen head on and I turned away from it. All the faces were very curious and whispered their questions, but I hissed at them and told them to shut up. The man in the hole returned a few moments later, and I was glad when he situated himself right in front of the harsh light. He handed me a roll of material and told me to write on it. I thanked him. He nodded and covered the hole. I went and retrieved Andrew's face and returned it to the spot. The faces were quite fond of where I hanged them, and I, I asked if he enjoyed his visit with Candace. The mouth was agape as if he'd been screaming when he was taken from his body. But he told me that he enjoyed his time with Candace, that she was very well-mannered, despite her disagreeable political views. He said that he wanted some time to think on whether or not she was worth having as a friend, so I patted his cheek and left him to reflect. The roll of material turned out to be some kind of thick paper or parchment, though it's inconsistently colored, as if it had been dipped in various dyes during preparation. Some parts are vanilla-colored, others are darker, some even as pale as ivory. The whole thing is about the size of a game board, but not as square, thicker in areas, but otherwise suitable for writing. It's what I've been writing on for the last twenty minutes or so. The pen is a regular pen. Black ink flows comfortably. It's obviously a bit harder to see in the darker section of material, so I occasionally have to apply a little more pressure and... Weirdly, this sometimes results in material peeling away in a really sickening fashion. I've had to ask the normal-faced man if he is more of the material should I need to recopy the thoughts I've written on the ruined parts. I must also ask him for a light. My only writing surface is the floor, and its light isn't strong enough to shine through the paper. Everyone wants to be mentioned. They've been tirelessly insisting upon being name-dropped in the story or journal or whatever you'd call this. Mark has been considerably incessant. Well, here you go, Mark. You've been mentioned. Carol, however, hasn't made a single plea, so I'll give her plenty of mentions. Carol is nice and friendly, and her face is solemn and respectful. She presents herself well, unlike many of the others who let their mouths hang open or eye sockets stare horrifically. I should probably wash them, being their caretaker and all, but I haven't any soap or towels. And if I did, I'd use them to clean my own flesh, which constantly, incessantly itches. If I scratch it, there's a terrible pain. Really just awful, inexpressible agony. And he hasn't seen fit to provide me with anything to treat it. I hurt. Always. Especially after wearing a face for too long. Splashing the wall water on myself only causes my face flesh to burn terribly. 
Last time I did that, I lost consciousness. The pain had been that bad. I don't want to even imagine what would happen if I were to slather the floor gunk on my face. Tastes horrible enough. I think I'm going to go to sleep now. I like to rest against the wall beneath Luke and Christopher. I doubt they're a couple, but I like to see them as so. They're both very kind-looking, even though Luke's mouth stretches all the way up to his ears and his nose is missing. It's really horrendous, but still. He seems like he'd be kind if he were alive. I can't really close my eyes anymore, so I just... I just sit beneath those two and I wait for my brain to just shut off. I'm going to roll the journal up and tuck it beneath me so that if he enters, he won't see it. He doesn't make me stand up or anything, usually just rips the face right off my head without bothering to make me look at him. So I can sit here and even if he comes in to take a face or give me one, he won't see the roll. I can't wait to share my story with the man in the hole. I wonder what he's going to do with it. I hope he publishes the journals to a big audience so that everyone will know how brave I've been despite the, the horrifying circumstances and how well I've taken care of the poor faces. I think I'd be really, really good at doing it professionally. I'm much better at this than I was at being a pharmacy tech and I wonder if anybody's noticed my absence. Surely they've at least started to wonder. Nothing else to add for now. I'd really like my face back, or maybe even Bryce's. I'd really like to go home, but I'm... I'm scared that if I ask to again... He'll take away the faces as punishment. And while it's dreadful and terrifying and dark here. I at least have company. Without them, I'd... I think I'd lose my mind. Good night. Journal entry number two of subject six. I've gained a few new faces, but none of them fit me very well. They're all fairly ugly. Must have been treated poorly in the man's care. They're all in pretty pitiable, almost wretched states. I'll take much better care of them, but I don't think there's anything I'll be able to do about their ragged and tarnished features. I've named them Frank, Hector, and Leah. Frank and Leah are married. Or so I've imagined. Well, Hector hasn't yet recovered from the death of his wife. He's not quite ready to date again. The rest of the gang has accepted them wholeheartedly, even perpetually embittered Greg. And I'm glad everyone's getting along. It's uplifting. My spirits have been pretty low ever since I found out the man in the hole, my would-be publisher, is... Uh, is... Uh, is dead. He appeared again a few hours ago, beckoned me to the hole in the wall behind Andrew. His voice had carried through Andrew's face, and upon hearing it, Andrew began screaming in terror. I rushed over to him, plucked him off the wall, and put him next to Candace, who kindly helped me to soothe the poor guy. Then, taking another face, I dressed myself, and I went over to the hole to greet my guest. Seen again behind the desk, in the sparsely furnished and harshly lit room, he asked if I had written out my thoughts yet. I told him that I had, excused myself so I could go grab the roll of paper, which I had hidden in the very back of the room, behind a mound of the hardened gunk. Bringing it back, I fed the roll through the hole and waited with bated breath, excited to hear what he thought of my journal. He warmly accepted it, smiling broadly with his beautiful real, pleasantly natural face, and unrolled the paper upon the desk. I blanched and audibly gasped at seeing and 
few stains on the edges, but he didn't care. He wiped those away. And wiped away those that he could. Then began reading. His eyes scanned the paper hungrily, but his expression had relaxed, appearing neither impressed nor disappointed. I was beyond nervous, and I kept making unnecessary and occasionally even uncomfortable adjustments to my borrowed face every couple of seconds as I waited. Finally, he reached the bottom. He looked up to me. For a moment, he was speechless, expressively passive. A smile stretched across his face. He said that he loved it. I nearly fainted. I'd been so nervous. He asked if I would mind continuing the work, saying that my audience would be desperate for more. I told him that I had already planned to continue writing for as long as I remained here. His smile broadened. He was... He was really quite handsome. And he passed along a few more blank pages keeping the one that I'd given him. I accepted the new canvases gratefully, and asked if he'd like me to focus on anything in particular. But just as he was about to say something, there was a knock from somewhere within the room, and a, a look of annoyance overcame his face. He excused himself, and he rose from the desk. And then he walked briskly to the immediate left of the hole out of sight. I waited still beaming with gratitude and pride at having my work complimented. I heard some whispering, the beginnings of some heated, though hushed exchange, followed by a soft thunk, which I thought nothing of in the moment. There were a few more sounds, most unrecognizable, and then he returned and he sat down at the desk. But it wasn't him. The person was wearing the same face, but it was now ill-fitting, too taut around the nose, too loose at the chin. And the whole thing was spattered with droplets of blood. The eyes weren't right either. They were now black and ugly. Whereas before they'd been green, glimmering. But before I could comment on the incongruities in his appearance, he asked if I wouldn't mind reviewing what he had discussed. And not wanting to seem impolite, I complied even though I knew that he wasn't the man with whom I'd been speaking moments ago. He nodded along, asking for clarification when I mentioned the new sheets of paper, which I showed him. Then he held up his hand in a gesture of pause, so that he could reread, read for the first time, the journal entry I'd showed the former wearer of his face. Upon finishing, he nodded, and dispassionately thanked me for my contribution, then he told me that I was free to go. I thanked him again. With more gratitude than he'd shown. And walked away. I heard the hole get covered, so I went over to Andrew, took him from the temporary place on the wall beside Candace, and replaced him at his usual spot. He protested. Had apparently been in the middle of a conversation about sprucing up the room decor, but I wasn't in the mood. I went to my sleeping spot beneath Luke and Christopher, unrolled a sheet of paper, and started what had just become this entry. I'm afraid. I don't know what's going on or who this new person is, but I don't think I like him very much. He had an air of malice. A subtly menacing demeanor beneath his interest in my work, which I... Suspect is feigned. If he sincerely is interested, his motivations don't seem to be the same as those of the other man in the hole in the wall. I don't know what his game is, but I can tell I won't like him very much. I just hope that he treats my work with care. I will continue to write. If only for my own relief and distraction from the dismal circumstances. The faces are, of course, asking about today's latest visit, but I don't think I'll tell them what happened. I don't... I don't want to upset them and spoil the good cheer brought on by the day's earlier arrivals. I'll continue to hide these from my jailer, as I do not think that he'd approve of them. I don't want him sealing my work. It's all that I have left, since I don't have my freedom. Or even my face. I hope tomorrow is better. 
Entry number three of subject six. He's taken all the faces. They're all gone. He didn't even leave me the one I'd been wearing. I have nothing. No face at all. My face flesh burns no matter what I do, no matter how much water I drink or how hard I try to sleep. The pain persists. It's maddening. I can't take it. Writing only helps a little. Keeps my mind focused on something else. Something just as immediate as the pain, but the pain is still here, eating away at my nerves, terrorizing me, and the light on the floor, the ever-present light beneath it, has, has gotten brighter. It's become nearly as intolerable as the pain, but I can't look away from it, because I need to write. Writing is all I have. Earlier today, while trying on all the faces so as to keep them from growing taut and unusable, there was a a knock at the door. I was startled because he hadn't ever knocked before. He'd always just come in, take what he wanted, or give me something and leave. And so I was thinking that the new man in the hole in the wall had decided to visit me through different means. I scrambled to put on a presentable face and then went to the door. But there's no knob on the door, no way for me to open it from inside, so I was only able to meekly call out, Come in! I hoped that he'd be able to enter from his side. The door opened slowly, gratingly, as if the, the opener wasn't accustomed to its cumbersome weight. I stepped back a little so to allow them some space to enter, and once the door was fully open, a figure stepped in. I didn't recognize the face. It belonged neither to him nor, nor to the new man in the hole on the wall. It was a normal face, but plainly not that of its wearer. It, the skin of the face and the wearer were different colors. I'm not one to judge a person's desire to change themselves, so I held my tongue, and I greeted them as cordially as circumstances would allow. I just used the facilities of my little enclosure a few minutes prior, and hadn't thought to dump a fresh chunk of grime into the little waste hole. I hadn't been expecting guests, after all, and the faces never complained. Not to me, at least. I'm sure they gossiped amongst themselves. My guest didn't seem to mind if he even smelled it at all and greeted me politely, complimenting my face, which he said I had fitted upon myself very well. I thanked him, I offered him some wall water, but he politely declined, saying that he wasn't going to be staying for long. That he just wanted to ask if I'd like to go for a walk. I was... Utterly stunned. I hadn't ever been offered anything, let alone a walk outside my room. Suddenly the walls, perfectly circular and draped with tattered blood, spattered and scarred faces, seemed oppressive, seemed suffocating. The floor now appeared to be, for the first time, disgustingly coated with grime and all manners of filth. The ceiling, unsettlingly dark and eerily immeasurable. Without hesitation, I shook my head in approval, and my guest stepped aside to allow me to walk out of the room. First, immediately beyond the door was a long corridor, so dark and narrow that for a moment I thought that I had somehow begun walking skyward, still within my own room, which I still kind of believed to be some kind of well or deep pit. But upon hearing the door close behind me, I was assured of my forward progress into another area and continued on down the lightless hall. I heard my guest following, so I saw no need to turn around, but something told me that if I should, that if I were to glance behind me, I'd see something I wouldn't like. So I kept my borrowed face and natural eyes forward until I suddenly came to another door. This one's strangely normal, not a thick slab of iron like the one that bars my room. Putting my hands on it, I felt that its surface was wood and raised in the center, em embossed with some kind of image. Its knob was cool, brass, and bulbous. Go on. Open it. Still unwilling to turn around, now feeling an instinctual perception of danger at the very idea, I obeyed the command and opened the door. It led into a room brightly lit for my eyes, which were, and still are, so accustomed to near-complete darkness by an old but luxurious chandelier affixed in the very center of the ceiling. It was a dining room of some kind with an 
ovoid brown table, brown chairs. A few feet away from the door, and a cabinet of china and other dishes, apparently reserved for special occasions off to the side. There were wooden shelves on all the yellow paper walls, and most of them were occupied by framed pictures. But no two pictures held the same person, or set of people. There was a different person's portrait within each dust-befallen frame, and all strangely were positioned so that they faced the dining table. Even if it required the frame to be precariously placed on the absolute edge of the shelf. The room s smelled faintly of bread, pastries, the lingering scent of an earlier and undoubtedly pleasant meal. Go on. Have a seat. There was a sudden edge to my guest's, or rather, my host's, voice, so I quickly took a seat at the table just beside the china cabinet. My host sat across from me, his back to another door with decor similar to that of the previous one. The embossed image was that of a face larger than life, with a stern, almost fierce expression. There were no other entrances to the room besides the two doors, not even windows. Despite it being smaller, this room actually felt more spacious than mine. I suppose empty darkness can be just as physically confining as a cluttered yet well-lit space. For a few moments, we simply sat across from one another, looking at each other's false faces while saying nothing. Then my host cleared his throat and flatly laid his hands on the table, palms facing down. His shoulders rose and fell, slowly, deliberately, as if he were steadying his breathing to calm himself. I felt a weird sense of animosity from him, but couldn't figure out what I could have possibly done to anger him. As far as I knew, I hadn't met him before. The face was wholly unfamiliar. Finally, when he had apparently regained what he'd lost of his composure, he looked me in the eyes and said, I know what you've been doing. His voice, which before had been as unfamiliar as his face, was now one I'd recognized. It was his voice. Up until that point, he had masked it perfectly. I hadn't at all suspected him to be the true identity of my host. Startled and suddenly feeling like I'd done something terribly wrong and was about to face a severe punishment, I raised my hands up above me as if there was a gun to my head and began sputtering out unfocused apologies, but he banged his hands on the table. Just once. But with enough force and violence that I immediately dropped my hands, shut my mouth, and went still. I was beyond terrified. He hadn't ever become violent with me, and I, weirdly, felt extremely uncomfortable and vulnerable within that room. Even though it offered more means of protection and escape than my own. My brother thought you'd be an interesting study, so I allowed him to sit with you. Had meant for him to just have one session, a little interview, but he became enamored and went behind my back to conduct another. I do not allow anyone to visit my subjects with any sort of frequency, and my brother was no exception. I had to rid myself of him. Violations of policy cannot be tolerated from anyone. And while curious, aren't worthy of rewriting policy, of making needless exceptions. So in a way, in a way, you killed my brother. I was just the tool that carried out the deed. I... I was floored. I hadn't thought for one second that there could be a familial connection between the two men. I had simply assumed that my room was some sort of nexus for other... random places, and that the man in the hole in the wall had been a random visitor. I guess the environment of my room, my diet of unidentifiable gunk... It messed with my mind. Looking him in the eye with as much sincerity as I could express through my now misaligned face, I said that I was sorry that I hadn't meant to cause his brother's death. He regarded me dispassionately for a while, shifting his own face to suit his preferences, and finally clapped his hands together and said, Well, no matter. What's done is done. Forgive and forget. But a punishment must follow. And while my brother has received his. You have not received yours. 
For a moment, my heart seemed to cease its beating, and my soul felt frigidly chilled as if blasted by some boreal wind. But just before panic could swell up and consume me, he pronounced my fate, which was not to be murdered, but something nearly as bad. With his smoldering dark eyes, he said, I'm going to take all of your faces. I, 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 I cried, even audibly protested, not caring if the tantrum would result in some physical reprimand, but he simply sat and patiently waited, and when the, the fire had died in my chest, I sat back in my seat and sulked. And after a few moments of this, he gestured for me to rise and head back towards the corridor. I complied. I went to the door I had come through. I ventured back into the lightless hall. I'm back in my room now. He took all the faces down one by one, and their confusion and protests were just awful to hear. Candace was particularly frightened. I almost begged him to let me keep her, but I knew that in doing so, I'd only make the others feel worse. Lastly, he came over and took the one I'd put on my face to meet him, leaving me with absolutely nothing. His parting remark was that I could still write if I'd like to, and that he'd still carry out his brother's mission. Sullenly, I said that I would. And so I have. The light beneath me, while brighter now, still can't cast enough light to show me what lies above. In the deeply and darkened shadows, but I feel like there's something new there, something I hadn't before perceived. I feel uncomfortable. Vulnerable. More so than usual, I have, a, I have a lot to think over and a lot to digest. Based on my conversation with him in that nicely furnished room, I don't think I'm the only one being kept here in this... this... dungeon? Compound? Whatever this is. My abduction must have happened two or three weeks ago by now, and yet I haven't met a single other imprisoned person. Only those two men and the faces and now with my only benefactor dead and my face is taken I'm more alone than ever I have no reason to hide the papers anymore so I guess I'll just leave this entry by the door when I'm finished there's no point in putting them through the hole in the wall anymore no one no one is there to receive them good night Journal entry number four of subject six. While tidying up my room, there wasn't much else to do. With the faces all gone. I happened to catch a glimpse of something in the floor through its light. It had been almost blinding to look at in the hours since its seeming source light was strengthened. Without eyelids, I had to face the faceless walls while sleeping. For a second, I, I caught sight of something in that ultra-luminous depth. An object of some kind, vaguely round, maybe 20 or 30 feet deep, far below the surface of the floor. I had never really regarded it as a transparent or translucent thing. I had always viewed it as a solid surface from which light somehow emitted. But I knew then came to realize with a sudden and undoubtable certainty that the floor was merely a transparent level beneath which existed something else. But I could only see the unknown object from a specific perspective, just beneath Greg's spot on the wall. Standing here facing the wall with my back flat as as flat as it can be to a curved surface. 
against the wall and looking at an angle about 60 degrees from my feet, I could see within the floor the object. Moving anywhere else obscured it in the harsh light, and trying to visibly focus on it also forced me to focus on the light, which subsequently made it harder to see the object. It was confounding, frustrating, and after maybe five minutes of trying to figure out what it was, I gave up and I went back to cleaning, while scraping gunk into the waste hole. A thought came to me. What if I tried to see something in the ceiling, you know, following the same principle that perhaps there was something to see from a particular perspective vantage? So I went to the center of the room, looking up, and I began walking around, first in a circular pattern, then in straight lines in the center in every direction, walking forward, backward, trying all kinds of bodily positions, but I didn't see anything after about 20 minutes, and I gave up on the endeavor. I cleaned up about as much as I could, so I went to my stack of thick leathery papers, intending to draw. I hadn't been forbidden from drawing. The idea hadn't occurred to me until then, but something about it, when I put the pen onto the paper, suddenly felt... felt wrong. Or rather, incompatible. As if I couldn't draw, rather than shouldn't. But I knew that I had always enjoyed doodling. I tried to focus, to really think of something to draw. But no matter how hard I thought, nothing developed. My pen hovered uselessly above the paper. Feminly embittered and more than a little frightened at the unexplainable inability to simply draw, I threw the pen and paper away from me. I watched the pen roll across the floor while the papers fluttered haphazardly above the floor. A few droplets of the wall water fell onto the paper that had come to settle, staining them blackly. I never wondered why the water was black. I simply drank it, attributing its color to some admixture of sediment from the walls or above. It hadn't yet killed me or even made me sick, so why wonder? But with everything gone, with my life falling apart for a second time, and that aggravating, inexorable light always in my face. I started to wonder, to really question my surroundings and situation for the first time. The delirium and dumb complacency that had persisted gnawed at my mind and prevented me from thinking clearly suddenly receded, and I was able to really take stock of my surroundings and be appropriately horrified by them. With a choking shock, I realized the utter state of decadence and squalor in which I had been living. Saw, almost with new eyes, the stinking, grime-encrusted hole a few feet from the heavy iron door in which I had for weeks deposited my bodily waste. I shrank away from the now oppressive walls, whilst also coming to newly and deeply fears of looming cavernous darkness above and detesting with a mounting revulsion the unwholesome subterranean light beneath my unspeakably dirty feet. It was a pit of torture, and I had stupidly called it my room, had hung the blood-spattered and wretched faces of dead people on its obsidian grime-coated walls. And the faces... Oh God, the faces... I had warned them on my own, well, not my face, on the subdermal flesh, pink and raw beneath it. My face had been stolen from me, taken by my sadistic jailer, and in exchange he'd given me the faces some hideously figured, others, others frozen expressions of black terror as some kind of sick reparation for his abominable act. And I, driven insane by my predicament, had hung them on the disgustingly adhesive walls. I'd, I'd spoken to them. Given them new names, personalities, and worst of all, worst of all, I applied them to my head and I, I'd worn them as masks to appear 
presentable to the very same men who had stripped me of my identity, uh, of my freedom. A compounding realization, this sudden and awful self-awareness were too much. I fell into my knees, gripping my raw face and screaming, not, not merely or even largely from the pain of the contact, but from the utter deplorable fate and cruelty to which I'd been subjected. I hadn't even in my life done anything to deserve such violence, such malice. I... I can't think of anyone who has. And that final and perhaps the most perplexing question came to me. How am I alive? Setting aside the fact that I had subsisted on strange black water and its gunk-like deposits for who knows how long, how had I not succumbed to an infection born of my raw flesh being exposed to an abysmally unhygienic environment? My nasal cavities, my eyes, my mouth, they all should have been horribly, incurably infected and rotting days or, or weeks ago, and yet, and yet while there had been pain, it's always tremendous pain, I had lived through it all. Lived with the necrotic tissue of over a dozen people affixed to my face, each for hours at a time. It, it was unreal, biomedically impossible. Coeval of this final self-directive and importantly unspoken inquiry, the light again brightened, becoming an almost tangible force from which I couldn't even turn away. It filled the room, becoming a mounting, fontic wave of physical sensation which rattled my bones with the sheer strength of its radiance. I was quickly bathed in its awful illumination as if the Earth's core had grown by several magnitudes. I writhed on the floor, unable to look away, unable to bear the omnipresent, agonizing light, and I was only spared from an even greater insanity by the sight above me, the newly illuminated ceiling of my abyssal pit center. In a moment of breathlessness, I watched as figures slowly resolved in the diminishing darkness. The once veiling shadows swept away by the still mounting light. A loud, sorrowful moan that escaped my lips, a, a wail of incredulity, terror, and grief all rolled into one. The figures of people, naked, hanging upside down by their ankles, their faceless heads swaying, dripping some strange black liquid. There were dozens, perhaps hundreds of them, swinging, gently rocking against one another from the soft vibrations of some unseen machinery or geological activity. Somehow the clanking of their chains had remained inaudible to me all this time. Somehow the collective corpse funk, putrid beyond expression, had not reached my nose until that very moment. Now the truth has been revealed to you. What will you do now? Come see me when you're able. The voice came from above, from beyond the carelessly suspended corpses. For a brief moment, I thought that one of them had spoken. The sound of my door opening quelled the hysteria that would have shortly arisen from, from that thought I turned away from the macabre sight. I was absolutely terrified and knew that something darkly, horribly, Momentous was happening, but couldn't figure out what, and knew that the only way to get answers would be to play along, to let the horrible sequence of events continue. Far more afraid than I had ever been, I left my room, entering the second time that pitch-black corridor. This time it was lit by torches, intermittently placed along both walls. There was nothing of real interest illuminated by their solo light, but the overall impression was one of baleful expectancy. They seemed to augur some horrible fate, ushering me along with their strangely flickering flames. I hurried down the length of the corridor, wanting to reach my destination and end the awful anxiety. The room beyond had not changed. It was still the same incongruously homely dining room, something which looked like it had been transplanted from a nice countryside farmstead. The only strange thing about it were the framed pictures. All of apparent strangers, 
None of them looked alike, all positioned to face the dining table, a table that could never accommodate such a large gathering. My host was not here, so I continued on to the other door, the one I hadn't gone through during my previous visit. I was briefly disturbed by the embossed image of the massive face, because for a moment I thought, thought that it had moved, still shifting its austere expression in some almost imperceptible way, but my mind quickly decided that I was only succumbing to the psychological effects of rattled nerves, and I quickly ignored the image. I reached for the knob, I opened the door, and I found myself staring into another hallway. This one artificially lit by regular lights, panels on the ceiling. The walls were covered in the same yellow wallpaper that covered the dining room, and were similarly faded, of an unguessable age. There was no furniture in this hall, no decorations, just a dilapidated yellowness that verged on being dismal, eerie even. At the other end was a forked path, one hall leading to my right, another to my left with a framed picture of some stranger on the wall at their junction. The portrait, while in black and white, vaguely resembled the face embossed on the doors of the dining room. A severe expression glared at me with an air of almost puritanical judgment. There were black candles on a silver tray beneath it, three of them of equal size, all lit with little white flames. I sensed an importance in the man's appearance, and an impression I gained more so from the image itself rather than its seemingly reverent placement in the hall. Take the path on the left, please. I obeyed the voice, which now sounded omnipresent, rather than originating from some hidden speaker. I continued on down the left hall. At the end of this was a door similar in build to the one that sealed my room. Gripping the heavy iron handle, I wrenched it open and found myself staring into a room not dissimilar to my own, albeit much cleaner. Its walls were not slick with grime, its floor while lit, was not harshly radiant, and there was no corpses that I could see, suspending from its ceiling. There was, however, a short stone pedestal at the center of the room on which sat something I immediately recognized. My face. The skin had been preserved very well, and the wounds I'd been inflicted with during my capture were virtually unnoticeable. The light from the floor illuminated the face brilliantly making it seem like some prize at the end of a long, nightmarish ordeal. I had almost forgotten what I looked like. I'd grown so accustomed to wearing the faces of others that mine almost seemed like a stranger's. I wanted to rush to it, to put it on and revel in the reacquisition of my identity, but there was... There was a sudden sound behind me. And turning around, I saw... Him. I knew it was him. Despite the mask he was wearing, his figure, immediately recognizable in my renewed mental clarity, was sickly, somehow imposing, having in his frame a sense of authority. His hunched shoulders, bent arms, head perpetually cocked to the side, the same figure as the man in the hole in the wall. Nakedly wearing only the mask, he closed the door and stepped into the scope of the floor's soft light. When I got a clear view of the mask, I had a sudden rush of emotion, a powerful surge of familiarity, but I couldn't place the face. I couldn't recall which of my friends it had been. The man continued on past me, going to stand beside the pedestal. He gestured to my face with an air of showmanship, as if presenting some rare and costly artifact to an audience of bidders. With this, you can reclaim your identity. You can take back yourself and leave this place. The nightmare will end, and you'll be free. You need only to pick it up and apply it to your face. It will conform to your features. It will seamlessly reattach itself. I'll then escort you out. Or, and he gestured to his own face here, you may have this one. This beautiful, painstakingly carved 
collage of faces. An amalgamation of all those with whom you have developed such beautiful friendships. They're all here. In some way. An eye. A brow. A lip. A freckle. A mole. A whisker. A strand of hair. A patch of skin. Everyone is here. In this face. Stitched together. And if you choose to, you may forsake your boring, ordinary face. Cast it into the dark and wear this one. She could join this beautiful collective. The idea, of course, was ludicrous to me. At first, I laughed almost insanely. But then the light dimmed and the darkness above seemed to grow, to become more fulsome, and the mask, the composite one, somehow seemed more appealing. More attractive in the increasing dimness. I remembered all of the conversations I'd had with the faces. All imagined, of course, but conversations I had nonetheless enjoyed. I remembered Candace and Andrew's begrudging friendship. Greg's incurable bitterness. Hector's musings on love and the tireless march of time. I inescapably found myself... Strangely nostalgic over isolation-born delusions, over remembrances, madness. Against reason and logic and all notions of self-preservation, I motioned for him to give me the amalgamate mask. And like a historian dealing with a priceless antique, he gently removed it from his face and placed it on my eagerly outstretched hands. With comparable, if not greater care, I placed it on my face and smoothed it out so that it rested firmly and comfortably on my flesh. The sensation, unlike before, not was painful, but rather the opposite. There was a calming effect. Almost narcotic in nature, the mask smelled of chemicals, of flowers, of other unnameable things, but not of death and decay. As the others had smelled the pain that ever persisted, the agony of my faceless flesh being exposed to the dungeon-like environment, it was also suppressed upon affixing the mask to the muscle and bone. And all at once, the faces spoke to me telling me of their time away, how frightened they had been, how wonderful it felt to be joined together in one beautiful image. I listened, smiling along with them, and I heard dimly the departure of the man, of my generous mask maker. Uh, he must have come sometime later, because after I removed the face to drink some water, I didn't want to stain it. I saw a pile of papers, the thick, skin-colored pages I'd left behind in my own room. There was a note attached which said, Continue your work here if you'd like. This can be your new room. It's much cleaner. I'm sure you'll find it to your liking. And I do. I do like it. There's none of the rampant filth and decay. The light from the floor is dim, barely noticeable. The darkness above like a shadowy blanket. Also, incredibly, I can wear the new amalgamate mask for as long as I want without feeling any pain or even the mildest discomfort. It's perfectly suited to me. Better than my own face was. And now I needn't soil the faces by hanging them on the walls. They can all feel equally appreciated. No one is left out. Everyone has a voice, a chance to speak, a chance to be worn. As I write this, as I write this, they can see the words forming on the pages. They could provide input or ask for clarification. We're all in this. Together, we all wear the same face. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepasta. And I wanted to tell you, thank you for watching today's video on YouTube or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. If you guys are watching on YouTube, then that means you can find the podcast on Spotify or anywhere else that you happen to listen to podcasts. And if you guys are listening on the podcast, hey, 
If you want to find some older episodes or a whole bunch of stories you've never seen before, you should check out youtube.com slash MrCreepyPasta. And no matter where you are, I really appreciate you hitting that subscribe button and hitting that bell reminder, just so that you can always find a new story as soon as it becomes available. And I want to give a big thank you, as always, to all of my Patreon subscribers on Patreon. Pa patron? All my patrons on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs. You are the ones that allow me to do stuff, like getting specific stories just for the channel. All those wonderful things that come from Dale Drake, those are because of all of you. If you guys want to see more of that, then I would really, really, really love if you guys could help support on Patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta like some of these wonderful guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krauss, Chaos Arts, Cryolinian, Milk and Meal, Silty K. Sterlerson, Zachary Graffius, It's All About That Fucking Music, Gorang Trimegacy, Maria Walker, Tanya Oren, Pain Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchak, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Dabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Chelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, Sky Mara Ravenswood, William King, Darth Milver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Sicardi, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. You guys, as well as everybody if you look down in the description, and everybody that can even just give one dollar to be able to help things out, I really appreciate it. If you guys would like to join this list of names that I horribly, horribly mispronounce, check out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and honestly, even you guys who just listen, you watch, you comment, you like, you subscribe, thank you all. I really appreciate it. And sweet dreams. <laughs>